He could not really grasp it, but he sensed the enormity of what she told him, and she saw it in his eyes. <coughs> now you know our secret, she laughed. If I have guessed right, we will double and redouble our fortune. And if it doesn't change, if the... He searched for the word. If the depression goes on and on forever, what then, Mater? She pouted and dropped her hands. Then, Cherie, nothing will matter very much, one way or the other. She started the Daimler and drove up the last pitch of the road to the bungalow, standing alone in its wide lawns, with lights burning in the windows and the servants lined up respectfully on the front veranda in their immaculate white livery to welcome her. She parked at the bottom of the steps, turned off the engine and turned to him again. No, Shasasheri, we are not going to be poor. We are going to be rich, much richer than we ever were before. And then later, through you, my darling, we will have power to go with our wealth. Great fortune, enormous power. Oh, I have it all planned, so carefully planned. Her words... Phil Shasser's head with turbulent thoughts. He could not sleep. Great fortune, enormous power. The words excited and disturbed him. He tried to visualise what they meant and saw himself like a strong man at the circus in leopard skins and leather wristbands, standing with arms akimbo, huge biceps flexed upon a pyramid of golden sovereigns while a congregation in white robes knelt and made obeisance before him. He ran the images through his head, over and over, each time altering some detail, all of them pleasurable, but lacking the final touch, until he bestowed upon one of his white road worshippers a crown of unruly, wind-tousled, sun-streaked curls. He placed her in the front rank, and she lifted her forehead from the ground, and stuck her tongue out at him. His erection was so quick and hard that it made him gasp, and before he could prevent himself, he had slipped his hand under the sheet and prized it out of the fly of his pyjamas. Jock Murphy had warned him about it. It will spoil your eye, Master Chasser. I have seen many a good man with a bat or a polo stick ruined by Mrs. Palm and her five daughters. But in his fantasy, Annalisa was sitting up, her long legs apart, and she was slowly drawing up the skirt of her white robe. The skin of her legs was smooth as butter, and he moaned softly. She was staring at the front of his leopard-skin costume, her tongue whisking lightly over her parted lips, and the white skirt rose higher and higher, and his fist began to jerk rhythmically. He could not prevent it. Up and up rode the white skirt, never quite reaching the fork of her crutch. Her legs seemed to stretch forever, like the railway tracks across the desert, running on and on and never meeting. He choked and jerked into a sitting position on the feather mattress, doubled over his flying fist, and when it came it was sharp and painful as a bayonet driven up into his intestines, and he cried out and fell back against the pillows. Annalisa's sly, grinning, freckled face receded, and the wet front of his pyjamas began to turn icy cold. But he did not have the will to strip them off. When the servant woke him with a tray of coffee and a dish of hard, sweet rusks, he felt dazed and exhausted. It was still dark outside, and he rolled over and pulled the pillows over his head. Madam, your mother, she says, I wait here until you get up, said the Ovambo servant darkly. And Shasa dragged himself to the bathroom, trying to conceal the dry stain on the front of his pyjamas. One of the grooms had his pony saddled and waiting at the front steps of the bungalow. Shasa took a moment to joke and laugh with the groom and then greet and caress his pony, rubbing foreheads with him and blowing softly into his nostrils. You are getting fat, Prester John, 
he chided the pony. We'll have to work that off you with the polo sticks. He swung up into the saddle and took the short cut, following the pipe track around the shoulder of the hill. The pipeline carried the water from the spring around the hills to the mine and the washing gear. He passed the pump house and felt a guilty pang at its associations with last night's depravity. But then the dawn lit the plains below the cliffs, and he forgot that in the pleasure of watching the veldt come alive and greet the sun. On this side of the hills, Santain had ordered the, that the forest be left untouched, and the Mapani was tall and stately. A covey of Franselin were dawn crying in the thicket down the slope, and a grey duica, returning from the spring, bounded across the track under the pony's nose. Shasa laughed as he shied theatrically. Stop that, you old show-off! He turned the corner of the cliff, and the contrast was depressing. The desecrated forest, the deforming scar of the workings on the hillside, the graceless square iron buildings, and the stark skeletal girders of the washing gear. How ugly they were! He gave the pony a touch with his heels, and they galloped the last mile, and reached the main haulage just as Twentyman Jones's old Ford came up the track from the village, with headlights still burning. He checked his watch as he stepped out, and looked sad as he saw that Shasa was three minutes ahead of time. Have you ever been down the haulage, Master Shasa? No, sir. He was going to add, my mater has never allowed it, but somehow that seemed superfluous, and for the first time he felt a twinge of resentment at his mother's all-pervading presence. Twentyman Jones led him to the head of the haulage and introduced him to the shift boss. Master Shasser will be working with you, he explained. Treat him normally, just like you would treat any other young man who will one day be your managing director, he instructed. It was impossible to tell by Twentyman Jones's expression when he was joking, so nobody laughed. Get a tin helmet for him, Twentyman Jones ordered, and while Shasser adjusted the straps of the helmet, he led him to the foot of the sheer cliff. The inclined tunnel had been cut into the base of the cliff, a round aperture into which the steel rail tracks angled downwards at 45 degrees, before disappearing into the dark depths. A string of cocoa pans stood at the head of the tracks, and Twentyman Jones led him to the first truck, and they climbed into the steel bin. The shift swarmed into the trucks behind them, a dozen white foremen and 150 black workers, in ragged, dusty overalls and helmets of bright, unpainted metal, laughing and ragging each other in boisterous horseplay. The steam winch of the winding gear clattered and hissed, and the string of trucks jerked forward, and then, rocking and swaying, ran down the steeply inclined ramp on the narrow-gauge railway tracks. The steel wheels, rumbling and clacking over the joints in the track, they dropped down into the dark moor of the tunnel. Chasseur stirred uneasily, stabbed with unreasoning fear, at the sudden absolute blackness that engulfed them. However, in the trucks behind him, the Ovambo miners were singing, their deep, melodious voices echoing in the dark confines of the tunnel, a marvellous chorus raised in an African work chant, and Shasser relaxed and leaned closer to Twentyman Jones to follow his explanation. The incline is 45 degrees, and the capacity of the winding gear is 100 tonnes. In mining parlance, that is 60 loads of ore. Our target is 600 loads of shift raised to the surface. Shasser was trying to concentrate on the figures. He knew his mother would question him this evening, but the darkness and singing and the rumble of the swaying trucks distracted him. Ahead of him there was a tiny coin of brilliant white light that grew swiftly in size until abruptly they burst out of the far end of the tunnel and involuntarily Shasser gasped with astonishment. 
He had studied the diagrams of the pipe, and of course they were photographs on his mother's desk at Velt Braden, but they had not adequately prepared him for its immensity. It was an almost perfectly round hole in the centre of the hills. It was open to the sky, and the sides of the excavation were vertical and sheer, a circular wall of grey rock like a cockpit. They had entered it through the tunnel that connected the workings to the far side of the hills, and the narrow ramp on which they were riding continued down at the same angle of 45 degrees until it reached the floor of the excavation 200 feet below them. The drop on either hand was breathtaking. The great rock-lined hole was a mile across, and its sheer walls 400 feet from the tip to the floor. Twentyman Jones was still lecturing him. This is a volcanic pipe, a blowhole from the Earth's depths, up which the molten magma was forced to the surface in the beginning of time. In those temperatures, as hot as the sun, and enormous pressures, the diamonds were forged, and they were brought up in the fiery lava. Chassa stared around him, screwing his head to take in the proportions of the huge excavation, as Twentyman Jones went on. Then the pipe was pinched off at depth, and the magma in it cooled and solidified. The upper layer, exposed to air and sun, was oxidised in the classical yellow ground of the diamondiferous formation. We worked down through that for eleven years, and only recently we reached the blue ground. He made an expansive gesture that took in the slaty blue rock that formed the floor of the huge pit. That is the deeper deposit of the solidified magma, hard as iron, and as full of diamonds as currents in a hot cross bun. They reached the floor of the workings and climbed down from the truck. The operation is fairly straightforward, Twentyman Jones went on. The new shift comes in at first light and begins work on the previous evening's blast. The broken ground is lashed and loaded into the cocoa pans and sent up the haulage to the surface. After that, they mark out and drill the shot holes for the next blast, and then they set the charges. At dusk, we pull out the shift, and the shift boss lights the fuses. After the blast, we leave the workings overnight to settle and for the fumes to disperse. Then, the next morning, we begin the whole process over again. There, he pointed to an area of shattered blue-grey rock, that's last night's blast. That's where we will begin today. Chassa had not expected to be so absorbed by the fascination of this mighty excavation, but his interest grew more intense as the day went on. Not even the heat and the dust daunted him. The heat was trapped between the sheer walls when at noon the sun beat down directly onto the uneven broken floor. The dust was flowery, rising from the shattered ore body as the hammer men swung their ten-pound sledges to crack the larger lumps into manageable pieces. The dust hung in a fog over the lashing teams as they loaded the cocoa pans, and it coated their faces and their bodies and turned them into ghostly grey albinos. We get a bit of miner's thesis, Twentyman Jones admitted. The dust gets into their lungs and turns to stone. Ideally, we should hose the ore down and keep it wet to lay the dust, but we're short of water. We haven't enough for the washing gear. We certainly can't afford to splash it around. So men die and are crippled, but it takes ten years to build up in the lungs. And we give them, or their widows, a good pension. And the miners' inspector is sympathetic, though his sympathy costs a penny. At noon, Twentyman Jones called Chassa across. Your mother said you need only work half the shift. I'm going up now. Are you coming? I'd rather not, sir, Chassa answered diffidently, 
I'd like to watch them charge the holes for the blast. Twentyman Jones shook his head sorrowfully. Chip off the old block. And he went away, still muttering. The shift bus allowed Chasser to light the fuses under his careful supervision. It gave Chasser a sense of importance and power to touch the flaring chisa stick, the igniter, to the bunch tips of the fuses, passing quickly down the line and watching the fire run down the twisted white fuses, turning them sizzling black in the swirl of blue smoke. He and the shift boss rode up on the haulage to the cry of Fire in the hole! And Chasser lingered at the head of the main haulage until the shots fired, and he felt the earth tremble beneath his feet. Then he saddled Prester John, and dusty, streaked with sweat, bone tired and happy, as he had seldom been in his life, he rode back along the pipe track. He was not even thinking about her when he reached the pump house. But there she was, perched up on top of the silver painted water pipe. The shock was such that when Prester John shied under him, he almost lost his seat and had to snatch at the pommel. She had plaited a wreath of wild flowers into her hair and unbuttoned the top of her blouse. In one of the books in the library at Belt of Raiden, there was an illustration of satyrs and nymphs dancing in the forest. The book was kept in the forbidden section to which his mother guarded the key. But Chasser had invested some of his pocket money in a duplicate, and lightly clad nymphs were among his favourites of all that treasure house of erotica. Annalisa was one of these, a wood nymph, only part human, and she slanted her eyes at him slyly, and her eye teeth were pointed and very white. Hello, Annalisa. His voice cracked treacherously, and his heart was beating so wildly that he thought it might spring under his throat and choke him. She smiled, but did not reply. Instead, she caressed her own arm, a slow, lingering stroke from her wrist to her bare shoulder. He watched her fingers raising the fine coppery hair on her forearm and his loins swelled. She leaned forward and placed her forefinger on her lower lip, still grinning slyly. And her bosom changed shape, and the opening of her blouse gaped, and he saw the skin in the V was so white and translucent that the tiny blue veins showed through it. He kicked out of the stirrups and swung a leg over Prester John's withers, in the showy polo player's forward dismount. But the girl, whirled to her feet, hoisted her skirts high, and with a flash of creamy thighs, sprang lightly over the pipeline and disappeared into the thick scrub on the hillside beyond. Chasser raced after her and found himself struggling through dense undergrowth. It clawed at his face and seized his legs. He heard her giggle once, not far ahead of him, but a rock twisted under his boot and he fell heavily, winding himself. When he pulled himself up and limped after her, she was gone. A while longer he floundered around in the scrub, his ardour swiftly cooling, and by the time he battled his way back to the pipe track to find that Pester John had taken full advantage of the diversion and decamped, he was bubbling over with anger at himself and the girl. It was a long tramp back to the bungalow, and he hadn't realised how tired he was. It was dark by the time he got home. The pony, with empty saddle, had raised the alarm, and Santaine's concern changed instantly to relieved fury when she saw him. A week in the heat and dust of the workings and the monotony of the work began to pall. So Twentyman Jones sent Sasser to work in the winch room of the main haulage. The winch driver was a taciturn, morose man and jealous of his job. He would not allow Sasser to touch the controls of the winch. 
My union doesn't allow it. He stood his ground stubbornly. And after two days, Twentyman Jones moved Chasser to the weathering ground. Here the ore was tipped out and spread in the open by gangs of Ovambo labourers, all stripped to the waist and chanting in chorus as they went through the laborious repetitive process of tip and spread under the urgings of their white supervisor and his gang of black boss boys. On this weathering ground lay the stockpile of the Harney mine. Thousands of tons of ore spread out on an area the size of four polo fields. When the blue ground was blasted out of the pipe, it was hard as concrete. Only gelignite and the ten-pound sledgehammers would break it. But after it had been lying in the sun on the weathering ground for six months, it began to break down and crumble until it was chalky and friable and could be reloaded into the cocoa pans and taken to the mill and the washing gear. Chasseau was placed in charge of a gang of 40 labourers and soon struck up a friendship with the Avambo boss boy. Like all the black tribesmen, he had two names, his tribal name, which he did not divulge to his white employers, and his work name. The Ovambo's work name was Moses. He was 15 years or so older than the other boss boys and had been selected for his intelligence and initiative. He spoke both English and Afrikaans well, and the respect that the black labourers usually reserved for the grey hair of age he earned from them with his billy club and boot and acid wit. If I was a white man, he told Chasseur, one day I would have Doc Teller's job. Doc Teller was the Ovambo name for Twentyman Jones, and Moses went on, I might still have it one day, or if not me, then my son. Shasa was shocked and then intrigued by such an outrageous notion. He had never before met a black who did not know his place in society. There was a disturbing presence about the tall of Ambo, who looked like one of the drawings of an Egyptian pharaoh from the forbidden section of the, of the Veltebraden Library. But that hint of danger made him much more intriguing to Chasser. They usually spent the lunch hour break together, Chasser helping Moses to perfect his reading and writing in the grubby ruled notebook, which was his most prized possession. In return, the Avambo taught Chasser the rudiments of his language, especially the oaths and insults, and the meaning of some of the work chants, most of which were ribald. Is baby-making work or pleasure? was the rhetorical opening question of Chasser's favourite chant. And he joined in the response to the delight of the gang he was supervising. It cannot be work, or the white man would make us do it for him. Chasser was just over 14 years old. Some of the men he supervised were three times his age, and none of them thought it strange. Instead, they responded to his teasing and his sunny smile and his sorry attempts to speak their language. His men were soon spreading five loads to four of the other teams, and they ended the second week as top gang on the grounds. Shazza was too involved with the work and his new friend to notice the dark looks of the white supervisor. And even when he made a pointed remark about the Kafaboites, or nigger lovers, Shasser did not take the reference personally. On the third Saturday, after the men had been paid at noon, he rode down to the boss boy's cottage at Moses' invitation and spent an hour sitting in the sun on the front doorstep of the cottage, drinking sour milk from the calabash that Moses' shy and pretty young wife offered, and helping him read aloud from the copy of Macaulay's History of England, he had smuggled out of the bungalow and brought down in his saddlebag. The book was one of his set works at school, so Chasser considered himself something of an authority on it, and he was enjoying the unusual role of teacher and instructor 
until at last Moses closed the book. This is very heavy work, good water. He had translated Shasa's name directly into the Ovambo. Worse than spreading ore in the summer. I will work on it later. And he went into the single-roomed cottage, placed the book in his locker, and came back with a roll of newspaper. Let us try this. He offered the paper to Shasa, who spread it on his lap. It was poor quality yellow newsprint, and the ink smudged under his fingers. The name on the top of the page was Umlomo Wabantu, and Shasa translated it without difficulty. The Mouth of the Black Nations. And he glanced down the columns of print. The articles were mostly in English, though there were a few in the vernacular. Moses pointed out the editorial, and they started working through it. What is the African National Congress? Shasa was puzzled. And who is Jabavu? Eagerly, the Ovambo began to explain, and Shasa's interest turned to unease as he listened. Jabavu is the father of the Bantu, of all the tribes, of all the black people. The African National Congress is the herder who guards our cattle. I don't understand. Shasa shook his head. He did not like the direction that the discussion was taking. And he began to squirm as Moses quoted, Your cattle are gone, my people. Go rescue them, go rescue them. Leave your breech loader and turn instead to the pen. Take paper and ink, for that will be your shield. Your rights are going. So take up your pen, load it with ink, and do battle with the pen. That is politics, Shasa interrupted him. Blacks don't take part in politics. That's white man's business. This was the cornerstone of the South African way of life. The glow went out of Moses' expression, and he lifted the newspaper off Shasa's lap and stood up. I will return your book to you when I have read it. He avoided Shasa's eyes and went back into the cottage. On the Monday, Twentyman Jones stopped Shasa at the main gate of the weathering grounds. I think you have learned all there is to know about weathering, Master Shasa. It's about time we moved you along to the mill house and the washing gear. As they followed the railway tracks up to the main plant, walking beside one of the cocoa pans which was full of the crumbling weathered ore. Twentyman Jones remarked, It is just as well not to become too familiar with the black labourers, Master Shasa. You will find they tend to take advantage if you do. Shasa was puzzled for a moment, and then he laughed. Oh, you mean Moses? He isn't a labourer, he is a boss boy, and he's jolly bright, sir. A bit too bright for his own good, Twentyman Jones agreed bitterly. The bright ones are always the malcontents and trouble stirrers. Give me an honest dumb nigger every time. Your friend Moses is trying to organise a black mine workers' union. Shasa knew from his grandfather and his mother that Bolsheviks and trade unionists were the most dreaded monsters intent on tearing down the framework of civilised society. He was appalled to learn that Moses was one of these. But Twentyman Jones was going on. We also suspect that he is at the centre of a nice little IDB operation. IDB was the other monster of civilised existence. Illicit diamond buying. The trade in stolen diamonds. And Shasser was revolted by the idea that his friend could be both a trade unionist and an illicit dealer. Yet Twentyman Jones's next words depressed him.
Twentyman Jones said, I am afraid Mr. Moses will head the list of those we will be laying off at the end of the month. He is a dangerous man. We will simply have to get shot of him. They are getting rid of him simply because the two of us are friends. Shasta saw through it. It's because of me. He was swamped with a sense of guilt, and guilt was followed almost immediately by anger. Quick words leapt to his tongue. He wanted to cry, It's not fair! But before he spoke, he looked at Twentyman Jones and knew intuitively that any defence he attempted of Moses would only seal the boss boy's fate. He shrugged. You know what is best, sir, he agreed, and he saw the slight relaxation in the set of the old man's shoulders. Mater, he thought. I will talk to Mater. And then, with intense frustration, if only I could do it myself. If only I could say what must be done. And then it dawned upon him that this was what his mother had meant when she spoke of power. The ability to change and direct the orders of existence that surrounded him. Power, he whispered to himself. One day I will have power. Enormous power. The work in the mill house was more exacting and interesting. The friable weathered ore was loaded into the bins and then fed through the hoppers onto the rollers, which crushed it to the correct consistency for the washing gear. The machinery was massive and powerful, the din almost deafening as the ore tumbled out of the hoppers into the feed chute and was sucked into the spinning steel rollers with a continuous roar. One hundred and fifty tons an hour. It went in one end as chalky lumps the size of ripe watermelons and poured out the far end as gravel and dust. Annalisa's brother, Stoffel, who had on Shasser's last visit to the Harney adjusted the timing on his old Ford and who was also the skilled mimic of bird calls, was now an apprentice in the mill house. He was delegated to show Shasser around and he undertook the assignment with gusto and relish. You have to be goddamn careful with the mucking settings on the rollers, or you crush the bloody diamonds to powder. Stoffel emphasised his newly acquired manliness and authority with oaths and obscenity. Come on, Shasser, I'll show you the grease points. All points have to be grease-gunned at the beginning of every shift. He crawled under the bank of thundering rollers, shouting into Shasser's ear to make himself heard. Last month, one of the other apprentices got his mucking arm in the bearing. It pulled it off like a chicken's wing, man. You should have seen the blood. Ghoulishly, he pointed out the dried stains on the concrete floor and galvanised walls. Man, I tell you, he squirted blood like a garden hose. Stoffel climbed the steel catwork like a monkey and they looked down on the roller mill tables. One of the Ovambo Kaffirs fell off here, right smack into the ore bin. There wasn't even a, even a scrap of bone bigger than your finger left of him when he came out the other end of the rollers. Yo, man, it's a bloody dangerous job, he told Shasa proudly. You've got to keep on your mucking toes all the time. When the mine hooter blew the lunch hour, he led Shasser around to the shady side of the mill house, and they perched comfortably on the ventilator housing. Under the sanction of the workplace, they could associate quite openly, and Shasser felt grown up and important in his blue workman's overalls as he opened the lunch box that the chef at the bungalow had sent down for him. Chicken and tongue sandwiches and jam roly poly. He checked the contents. Do you want some stoffel? <coughs> No, man, here comes my sister with my lunch. And Shasa lost all interest in his own lunchbox. Annalisa was pedalling down the avenue on a black-framed rudge with the nest of canteens dangling from the handlebars. It was the first time that he had seen her since the meeting at the pump house, though he had looked for her each day since then. She had tucked her skirts into her bloomers to keep them clear of the chain. She stood up on the pedals 
and her legs pumped rhythmically as she came through the gates of the mill house, and the wind flattened the thin stuff of her dress against the front of her body. Her breasts were disproportionately large for her slim brown limbs. Shasa watched her with total fascination. She became aware of him, sitting beside her brother, and her entire bearing changed. She dropped back onto the saddle and squared her shoulders, lifting one hand from the handlebars to try and smooth the wind-blown tangle of her hair. She braked the rudge, stepped down off the pedals and propped the machine against the bottom of the ventilator housing. What's for lunch, Lisa? Stoffel Boother demanded. Sausage and mass. She handed the canteens up to him. Same as always. The sleeves of her dress were cut back, and when she lifted her arms, Shasa saw the bush of coarse blonde hair in her armpits, tangled and wet with perspiration, and he crossed his legs quickly. Sis, man! Stoffel registered his disgust. It's always sausage and mash. Next time I'll ask Ma to cook fillet steak and mushrooms, she said, and she lowered her arms. And Shasa realised he was staring but could not stop himself. She pulled the opening at the neck of her blouse closed, and he saw the faint flush under the suntan skin at her throat, but she had not yet looked directly at him. Thanks for nothing. Stoffel dismissed her, but she lingered. You can have some of mine, Shasa offered. I'll swap you, Stoffel offered generously, and Shasa glanced into the canteen and saw the lumpy potato mash swimming in thin, greasy gravy. I'm not hungry, Shasa said, and he looked at the girl for the first time. Would you like a sandwich, Annalisa? She smoothed the skirt over her hips and looked directly at him at last. Her eyes slanted like a wild cat's, and she grinned slyly. When I want something from you, Shasa Courtney, I will whistle for it, like this. She pouted her lips into a rosy cupid's bow, and whistled like a snake charmer. At the same time, slowly raising her forefinger. In an unmistakably obscene gesture, Stoffel let out a delighted guffaw and punched Shasa's arm. Man, she's got the hots for you. While Shasa blushed scarlet and sat speechless with shock, Annalisa turned away deliberately and picked up the bicycle. She went out through the gates, standing on the pedals and swinging the rudge from side to side under her, so that her tight round buttocks oscillated with each stroke. That evening, as he turned Presta John onto the pipe track, Shasa's pulse started to gallop with anticipation. And as he approached the pump house, he slowed the pony to a walk, afraid of disappointment, reluctant to turn the corner of the building. Yet he was still not prepared for the shock when he saw her. She was draped languidly against one of the stanchions of the pipeline. And Shasa was speechless as she came slowly upright, and sauntered to the head of his pony without looking up at the rider. She held the cheek strap of his halter and crooned to the pony, "What a pretty boy!" The pony blew through his nostrils and shifted his weight. "What a lovely soft nose!" She stroked his muzzle with a lingering touch. Would you like a little kiss, then, my pretty boy? She pursed her lips, pink and soft and moist, and glanced up at Shasa, before she leaned forward and deliberately kissed the pony's muzzle, slipping her arms around his neck. She held the kiss for long seconds and then laid her cheek against the pony's cheek, beginning to sway, humming softly in her throat and rocking her hips gently. She at last looked up at Shasa with those sly, slanting eyes. He was struggling to find something to say, confused by the rush of his emotions, and she moved slowly to the pony's shoulder, and stroked his flank. 
so strong. Her hand brushed Shasa's thigh lightly, almost unintentionally, and then came back more deliberately, and she was no longer looking at his face. He could not cover himself, could not hide his violent reaction to her touch, and suddenly she let out a shocking screech of laughter and stood back with both hands on her hips. Are you going to camp out, Shasa Courtney? she demanded, and he was puzzled and embarrassed. He shook his head dumbly. Then what are you putting up a tent for? she hooted, gazing shamelessly at the front of his breeches, and he doubled up awkwardly in the saddle. With a disconcerting change of mood, she seemed to take pity on him, and she went back to the pony's head and led him along the track, giving Shasa a chance to recover his composure. What did my brother tell you about me? she asked without looking round. Nothing, he assured her. Don't believe what he says, she was unconvinced. He always tries to make out bad things about me. Did he tell you about Fori, the driver? Everybody at the mine knew how Gerhard Fori's wife had caught the two of them in the cab of his truck after the Christmas party. Fori's wife was older than Annalise's mother, but she had blackened both the girl's eyes and torn her only good dress to tatters. He didn't tell me anything, Shasa reiterated stoutly, and then with interest, what happened? Nothing, she said quickly. It was all lies. And then with another change of direction. Would you like me to show you something? Yes, please, Shasa answered with alacrity. He had an inkling of what it might be. Give me an arm. She came to his stirrup and he leaned down and they hooked elbows. He swung her up and she was light and strong. She sat behind him astride the pony's rump and slid both arms around Shasa's waist. Take the path to the left, she directed him, and they rode in silence for ten minutes. How old are you? she asked at last. Almost fifteen. He stretched the truth a little and she said, I'll be sixteen in two months. If there had been any doubts as to who was in charge... This declaration effectively settled it. Shasser deferred to her, and she felt it in his carriage. She pressed her breasts to his back as though to emphasise her control, and they were big and rubbery hard, and burned him through his thin cotton shirt. Where are we going? he asked after another long silence. They had bypassed the bungalow. Hush up! I'll show you when we get there. The track had narrowed and become rougher. Shasser doubted anybody had passed this way in months, other than the small wild beasts that still lived this close to the mine. Finally, it petered out altogether against the base of the cliff, and Annalisa slid down from the pony's back. Leave your horse here. He tethered the pony and looked around him with interest. He had never been so far along the base of the cliffs. They must be three miles from the bungalow, at least. Below them, the scree slope plunged downwards at a steep angle, and the ground was riven with gorges and ravines, all of them choked with rank, thorny undergrowth. Come on, Annalisa ordered. We haven't got much time. It will be dark soon. She ducked under a branch and started down the slope. Hey, Shasa cautioned her. You can't go down there. You'll hurt yourself. You're scared, she mocked. I am not. The taunt goaded him onto the rock-strewn slope, and they climbed downwards. Once, Annalisa paused to pluck a spray of yellow flowers from a thorn bush. Then they went on, helping each other over the bad places, crouching under the thorn branches, teetering on the boulders, and hopping across the gaps like a pair of rock rabbits, until they reached the bottom of the ravine and paused to catch their breath. Shasa bent backwards from the waist and stared up at the cliff that towered above them, sheer as a fortress wall, but Annalisa tugged his arm to gain his attention. It's a secret, she said. You have to swear an oath not to tell anybody, 
especially not my brother. All right, I swear, said Shasa. You have to do it properly. Lift your right hand and put the other on your heart, she said. Solemnly she led him through the oath, and then took his hand and drew him to a lichen-covered pile of boulders. Kneel down. He obeyed, and she carefully pulled aside a leafy branch that screened a niche amongst the boulders. Shasa gasped and pulled back, coming half to his feet. The niche was shaped like a shrine. There was a collection of empty glass jars arranged on the floor, but the wild flowers in them had withered and turned brown. Beyond the floral offering, a pile of white bones had been carefully arranged into a small pyramid, and surmounting this was a human skull, with gaping eye sockets and yellow teeth. Who is it? Shasa whispered, his eyes wide with superstitious awe. The witch of the mountain. Annalisa took his hand. I found her bones lying here, and I made this magic place. How do you know she's a witch? Shasa had a bad attack of the creeps by now, and his whisper shook and cracked. She told me so. That raised such frightful images that he did not question her further. Skulls and bones were creepy enough. Voices from beyond were a hundred times worse, and the hairs at the back of his neck and along his arms itched and stood erect. He watched while she changed the withered flowers for the fresh yellow acacia blossom, and then sat back on her ankles, and took his hand again. The witch. Will grant you one wish," she whispered, and he thought about it. "What do you want?" She tugged his hand. "Can I wish for anything?" he asked. "Yes, anything," she nodded, watching his face eagerly. Staring at the bleached skull, his awe faded. He was suddenly aware of a new sensation. Something seemed to reach out to him, a sensation of warmth and familiar comfort that he had known before only as an infant, when his mother held him to her bosom. There were still small pieces of dried scalp attached to the dome of the skull, like brown parchment, and tiny peppercorns of black hair, soft, furry little balls like those on the head of the tame bushman who herded the milk cows at the way station. On the road from Windhoek. Anything, he repeated. I can wish for anything. Yes, anything you want. Annalisa leaned against his side, and she was soft and warm, and her body smelled of fresh, sweet, young sweat. Shasta leaned forward and touched the skull on its white, bony forehead. And the sense of warmth and comfort was stronger. He was aware of a benign feeling, of love. That was not too strong a word. Yes, of love, as though he were being overlooked by someone or something that cared for him very deeply. I wish, he said softly, almost dreamily. I wish for enormous power. He imagined a prickling sensation in the fingertips that touched the skull, like the discharge of static electricity, and he jerked his hand away sharply. Annalisa exclaimed in exasperation and pulled her body away from him at the same time. "That's a silly wish." She was clearly piqued, and he could not understand why. <clears throat> "You are a stupid boy, and the witch won't grant a stupid wish like that." She flounced to her feet and drew the screening branch over the niche. It's late; we must go back. Shasta did not want to leave this place, and he lingered. Annalisa called from up the slope. "Come on! It will be dark in an hour." When he reached the path again, she was sitting propped against the rock wall of the cliff, facing him. "I've hurt myself," she said, it like an accusation. 
They were both flushed and panting from the climb. I'm sorry, he gasped. How did you hurt yourself? She pulled the hem of her skirt halfway up her thigh. One of the red-tipped wait-a-bit thorns had roweled her, raising a long red scratch across the smooth, buttery skin of her inner thigh. It had barely broken the skin, but a line of blood droplets had welled up, like a necklace of tiny bright rubies. He stirred at it as though mesmerized, and she sank back against the rock, lifted her knees and spread her thighs, holding the bunch of her skirts into her crutch. Put some spit on it, she ordered. Obediently, he knelt between her feet and wet his forefinger. Your finger is dirty, she admonished him. Well, what shall I do then? He was at a loss. With your tongue. Put spit on it with your tongue. He leaned forward and touched the wound with the tip of his tongue. Her blood had a strange, salty, metallic taste as he licked it. She placed one hand on the nape of his neck and stroked the dense, dark curl of his hair. Yes, like that, clean it, she murmured. Her fingers twisted into his hair and she held his head, pressing his face to her skin, and then deliberately directed him higher, raising her skirt slowly with her free hand as his mouth travelled upwards. Then, peering between the th spread of her thighs, he saw that she was sitting on a piece of her clothing, a scrap of white cloth printed with pink roses. And with a tingle of shock he realised that in the few minutes that she had been alone, she must have removed her panties and spread them as a cushion on the soft, moss-covered earth. She was naked under the skirt. Chasse woke with a start and he could not think where he was. The ground was hard under his back, and a pebble was digging into his shoulder. There was a weight across his chest, making it difficult for him to breathe. He was cold, and it was dark. Prester John stamped and snorted, and he saw the pony's head silhouetted against the stars. Suddenly he remembered. Annalise's leg was thrown over his, and her face was against his throat. She sprawled half across his chest. He pushed her off so violently that she woke with a cry. It's dark, he said stupidly. They'll be out looking for us by now. He tried to stand, but his breeches were around his knees. He remembered vividly the practised way that she had unbuttoned them and worked them over his hips. He yanked them up and fumbled with his fly. We've got to get back. My mother... Annalisa was on her feet beside him, hopping on one leg as she tried to find the opening of her panties with her bare foot. Shasta looked at the stars. Orion was on the horizon. It's after nine o'clock, he said gloomily. You should have stayed awake, she whined and put a hand on his shoulder to steady herself. My pa will lather me. He said next time he'd kill me. Shasta shrugged off her hand. He wanted to get away from her, yet he knew he could not. It was your fault. She stooped and grabbed her panties at the ankles, hoisted them to her waist and then settled her skirts over them. I'm going to tell Pa that it was your fault. He'll take the jambok to me this time. Oh, he'll whop the skin off me. Shasta unhitched the pony and his hands were shaking. He could not think clearly and he was still half asleep and groggy. I won't let him. His gallantry was half-hearted and unconvincing. I won't let him hurt you. It seemed only to infuriate her. What can you do? You're only a baby. The word triggered something else in her mind. What will happen if you've given me a baby, hey? It'll be a bastard. Did you think of that while you were sticking that thing of yours into me? She demanded waspishly. Shasha was stung by the unfairness of her accusation. You showed me how. I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't. A fat lot of good that's going to do us, she said, and she was weeping now. I wish we could just run away. The notion held a definite appeal for Sasha. 
and he discarded it only reluctantly. Come on, he said, and boosted her up onto Prester John's back and then swung up behind her. They saw the torches of the search parties down on the plain below them as they turned the shoulder of the mountain. There were headlights on the road also, moving slowly, obviously searching the verges, and faintly they heard the shouts of the searchers, calling for them as they moved about in the forest far below. My pa's going to kill me this time. He'll know what we've been doing. She snuffled and sobbed, and her self-pity irritated him. He had long ago given up trying to comfort her. How will he know? he snapped. He wasn't there. You don't think you were the first one I've done it with, she demanded, seeking to injure him. I've done it with plenty of others, and Pa has caught me twice. Oh, he'll know all right. At the thought of her performing those strangely marvellous tricks of hers with others, Shasa felt a hot rush of jealousy, which was gradually cooled by reason. Well, he pointed out, if he knows all about the others, it isn't going to do you much good to try to put the blame on me. She had trapped herself, and she let out another broken-hearted sob, and was still weeping theatrically when they met the search party coming on foot along the pipe track. Shasa and Annalisa sat on opposite sides of the bungalow's drawing room, instinctively keeping as far from each other as possible. As they heard the Daimler pull up outside in a flare of headlights and crunch of gravel, Annalisa began to weep again, snuffling and rubbing her eyes to work up a few more tears. They heard Sontaine's quick, light tread across the veranda, followed by Twentyman Jones's more deliberate, stork-like steps. Shasser stood up and held his hands in front of him, in the attitude of the penitent, as Sontaine stopped in the doorway. She was dressed in yodpers and riding boots, and a tweed hacking jacket, with a yellow scarf knotted at her throat. She was flushed, and relieved and furious as an avenging angel. Annalisa saw her face and let out a howl of anguish, only half acting. Shut your mouth, girl, Santaine told her quietly, or I'll see you get good reason to blubber. She turned to Chasse. Are either of you hurt? No, Mater, he hung his head. Prester John? Oh, he's in good fettle. So, that's it, then. She did not have to elaborate. Dr. Twentyman-Jones, will you take this young lady down to her father? I have no doubt that he will know how to deal with her. Santaine had spoken briefly to the father only an hour before, big and bald and paunchy, with tattoos on his muscled arms, belligerent and red-eyed, reeking of cheap brandy, and opening and closing his hairy paws as he mouthed his intentions towards his only daughter. Twentyman Jones took the girl by her wrist, pulled her to her feet and led her, snivelling towards the door. As he passed Santaine, her expression softened and she touched his arm. Whatever would I do without you, Dr. Twentyman Jones? she asked quietly. I suspect that you would get along very well on your own, Mrs. Courtney, but I'm glad I could help. He dragged Annalisa from the room, and they heard the whir of the Daimler's engine. Sontaine's expression hardened again, and she turned back to Chasseur. He fidgeted under her scrutiny. You've been disobedient, she told him. I warned you away from that little pool. Yes, Mater. She's been with half the men on the mine. We'll have to take you to a doctor when we get back to Windhoek. He shuddered and glanced down at himself involuntary, at the thought of a host of disgusting microbes crawling over his most intimate flesh. Disobedience is bad enough. But what have you done that is truly unforgivable? she demanded. 
Shasa could think of at least a dozen trespasses without really extending himself. You've been stupid, Santane said. You've been stupid enough to get caught out. That is the worst sin. You made a laughing stock of yourself with everybody on the mine. How will you ever be able to lead and command when you cheapen yourself like this? I didn't think of that, Mater, said Shasa. I didn't think of anything much. It just all sort of happened. Well, think of it now, she told him, while you are taking a long hot bath with half a bottle of Lysol in it. Think hard about it. Good night. Good night, Mater. He came to her, and after a moment she offered her cheek. I'm sorry, Mater. He kissed her cheek. I'm sorry I made you ashamed of me. She wanted to throw her arms around him and pull his beautiful beloved head to her and hold him hard and tell him that she would never be ashamed of him. Good night, Chasser, she said, standing cool and erect until he left the room and she heard his footsteps drag disconsolately down the passage. Then her shoulders slumped. Oh, my darling, oh, my baby, she whispered. Suddenly, for the first time in many years, she felt the need for an opiate. She crossed quickly to the massive stinkwood cabinet and poured cognac from one of the heavy decanters and took a mouthful. The spirit was peppery on her tongue and the fumes brought tears to her eyes. She swallowed it down and set the glass aside. That isn't going to help much she decided, and crossed to her desk. She sat down in the winged, buttonholed leather chair, and she felt small and frail and vulnerable. For Santaine, it was an alien emotion, and it frightened her. It's happened, she whispered. He is becoming a man. Suddenly she hated the girl. The dirty little harlot! She isn't ready for that yet! Too early she has let the demon out, the demon of his dithyri blood. She was intimate with the same demon, for it had plagued her all her life, that wild, passionate dithyri blood. Oh, my darling. She was going to lose some part of him now. Had already lost it, she realised. Loneliness came to her like a ravening beast that had lain in ambush for her all these years. There had only been two men who might have assuaged that loneliness. Shasta's father had died in his frail machine of canvas and wood, while she had stood by helplessly and watched him blacken and burn. The other man had placed himself beyond her reach forever with one brutal, senseless act. Michael Courtney and Lothar de la Rey, both dead to her now. Since then there had been lovers, many lovers. Brief, transient affairs experienced only at the level of the flesh, a mere antidote for the boil of her blood. None of them had been allowed to pass into that deep place of her soul. But now the beast of loneliness burst through those guarded portals and laid waste her secret places. If only there was someone she lamented, as she had done only once before in her life, when she lay upon the childbed on which she had given birth to Luther de la Rey's gold-headed bastard. If only there was somebody I could love, and who would love me in return. She leaned forward in the big leather chair and picked up the silver-framed photograph, the photograph that she carried with her wherever she travelled, and studied the face of the young man in the centre of the group of flyers. For the first time she realised that over the years the picture had faded and yellowed, and the features of Michael Courtney, Shasser's father, had blurred. She stared at the handsome young face and tried desperately to make the picture clearer and crisper in her own memory. But it seemed to smear and recede even further from her, 
Oh, Michel, she whispered, it was all so long ago. Forgive me, please forgive me. I have tried to be strong and brave. I have tried for your sake and the sake of your son, but... She set the frame back upon the desk and crossed to the window. She stared out into the darkness. I'm going to lose my baby, she thought. And then one day I will be alone and old and ugly, and I'm afraid. She found she was shivering, hugging her own arms, but then her reaction was swift and unequivocal. There is no time for weakness and self-pity on the journey that you have chosen. She steeled herself, standing small and erect and alone in the silent, darkened house. You have to go on. There is no turning back, no faltering. You have to go on to the end. Where is Stoffel Botha? Chesser demanded of the millhouse supervisor when the mine hooter blew the signal, the beginning of the lunch hour. Why isn't he here? Who knows? The supervisor shrugged. I had a note from the main office saying he wasn't coming. They didn't tell me why. Perhaps he has been fired. I don't know. I don't care. He was a cocky little bastard anyway. And for the rest of the shift... Chasser tried to suppress his feeling of guilt by concentrating on the run of ore through the thundering rollers. When the final hooter blew, and the cry of, Shahili, it has struck, was shouted from one gang of black labourers to the next, Chasser mounted Prester John and turned his head towards the avenue of cottages in which Annalisa's family lived. He knew he was risking his mother's wrath, but a defiant sense of chivalry urged him on. He had to find out how much damage and unhappiness he had caused. However, at the gates of the mill house, he was distracted. Moses, the boss boy from the weathering grounds, stepped in front of Prester John and took his head. I see you, good water. He greeted Shasser in his soft, deep voice. Oh, Moses! Shasser smiled with pleasure, his other troubles forgotten for the moment. I was going to visit you. I have brought your book. The Ovambo handed the thick copy of History of England up to him. You couldn't possibly have read it, Shasser protested. Not so soon. It took even me months. I will never read it, good water. I am leaving the Harney Mine. I go with the trucks to Vinhoek tomorrow morning. Oh, no! Shasa swung down out of the saddle and gripped his arm. Why do you want to go, Moses? Shasa feigned ignorance out of a sense of his guilt and complicity. It is not for me to want or not to want. The tall boss boy shrugged. Many men are leaving on the trucks tomorrow. Doc Teller has chosen them, and the lady your mother has explained the reason and given us a month's wages. A man like me does not ask questions, good water. He smiled, a sad, bitter grimace. Here is your book. Keep it, Shasa pushed it back. It is my gift to you. Very well, good water. I will keep it to remind me of you. Stay in peace. He turned away. Moses! Shasa called him back and, and then could find nothing to say. He thrust out his hand impulsively, and the Avambo stepped back from it. A white man and a black man did not shake hands. Go in peace, Shasser insisted, and Moses glanced around almost furtively before he accepted the grip. His skin was strangely cool. Shasser wondered if all black skin was like that. We are friends, Shasser said, prolonging the contact. We are, aren't we? I do not know. What do you mean? asked Shasser. 
I do not know if it is possible for us to be friends. Gently he freed his hand and turned away. He did not look back at Shasa as he skirted the security fence and went down to the compound. The convoy of heavy trucks ground across the plains, keeping open intervals to avoid the dust thrown up by the preceding vehicle. The dust rose in a feathery spray, high in the still heated air, like the yellow smoke from a bush fire burning on a wide front. Gerhard Fury, in the lead truck, slumped at the wheel with his belly hanging into his lap. It had forced open the buttons of his shirt, exposing the hairy pit of his navel. Every few seconds he glanced up from the road to the rear-view mirror above his head. The back of the truck was piled with the baggage and furniture of the families, both black and white, that had been laid off from the mine. On top of this load were perched the unfortunate owners. The women had knotted scars over their hair for the dust. They clutched their young children as the trucks bounced and swayed over the uneven tracks. The elder children had made nests for themselves amongst the baggage. Fori reached up and readjusted the mirror slightly, centering the image of the girl behind him. She was wedged between an old tea chest and a shabby suitcase of imitation leather. She had propped a blanket roll behind her back and she was dozing, her streaky blonde head nodding and lolling to the truck's motion. One knee was slightly raised, her short skirt rocked up, and as she fell asleep, so her knee dropped to one side, and Fori caught a glimpse of her underpants, patterned with pink roses, wedged between those smooth young thighs. Then the girl jerked awake and closed her legs and rolled on her side. Fori was sweating, not merely from the heat. Drops of it glinted in the dark, unshaven stubble that covered his jowls. He took the stub of a cigarette from between his lips with shaky fingers and inspected it. Saliva had soaked through the rice paper and stained it with yellow tobacco juice. He flicked it out of the side window and lit another, driving with one hand and watching the mirror, waiting for the girl to move again. He had sampled that young flesh. He knew how sweet and warm and available it was, and he wanted it again with a sickness of desire. He was prepared to take any risk for just another taste of it. Ahead of him, the clump of grey camel-thorn trees swam out of the heat mirage. He had travelled this road so often that the journey had its landmarks and rituals. He checked his pocket watch and grunted. They were twenty minutes late on this stage, but then trucks were all overloaded with this throng of newly unemployed and their pathetic possessions. He pulled the truck off the track beside the trees and climbed stiffly out onto the running board and shouted, All right, everybody, pinkle paws, women on the left, men on the right. Anybody who isn't back in ten minutes gets left behind. He was the first back to the truck, and he busied himself at the left-hand rear wheel, making a show of checking the valve, but watching for the girl. She came out from amongst the trees, smoothing her skirts. She looked petulant and hot and grubby with flowery dust. But when she saw Fauri watching her, she tossed her head and swung her tight little buttocks and ostentatiously ignored him. Aunt Elisa, he whispered, as she raised one bare foot to climb over the tailboard of the truck beside him. Your mother's, Gerard Fauri, she hissed back at him. You just leave me alone or I'll tell my pa. At any other time, she might have responded more amiably, but her thighs and buttocks and the small of her back were still crisscrossed with purple wheels from where her father had lambasted her. Temporarily, she had lost interest in the male sex. "'I want to talk to you,' Fauri insisted. "'Talk? Ha! I know what you want!' 
Meet me outside the camp tonight, he pleaded. Your bollocks in a barrel. She jumped up into the truck, and his stomach turned over as he saw the full length of those slim brown legs. Annalisa, I'll give you money. He was desperate. The sickness was burning him up. Annalisa paused and looked down at him thoughtfully. His offer was a revelation that opened a chink into a new world of fascinating possibilities. Up to that moment it had never occurred to her that a man might give her money to do something which she enjoyed more than eating or sleeping. How much? she asked with interest. A pound, he offered. It was a great deal of money, more than she had ever had in her hand at any one time. But her mercenary instinct was aroused. She wanted to see how far this could be taken. She tossed her head and flounced, watching him out of the corner of her eye. Two pounds, Fourie whispered urgently, and Annalisa's spirit soared. Two whole pounds. She felt bold and pretty and borne along by good fortune. The stripes across her back and legs were fading. She slanted her eyes in that sly, knowing expression that maddened him, and she saw the sweat start on his chin, and his lower lip trembled. It emboldened her even further, and she drew breath and held it, and then whispered, daringly, Five pounds! She ran the tip of her tongue around her lips, shocked by her own courage in naming such an enormous sum. It was almost as much as her father earned in a week. Fori blanched and wavered. Three, he blurted, but she sensed how close he was to agreement, and she drew back affronted. You are a smelly old man. She filled her voice with scorn and turned away. All right, all right, he capitulated. Five pounds. She grinned at him victoriously. She had discovered and entered a new world of endless riches and pleasure. She put the tip of her finger in her mouth. And if you want that too, it will cost you another pound. There were no limits to her daring now. The moon was only dazed from full, and it washed the desert with molten platinum, while the shadows along the ravine walls were leaden blue smudges. The camp sounds carried faintly along the ravine. Somebody was chopping firewood, a bucket clanged, and the women's voices at the cooking fires were like bird sounds heard from afar. Closer at hand, a pair of prowling jackal cried. The odours from the cooking pots exciting them into their wild, wailing, almost agonised chorus. Foris squatted against the wall of the ravine and lit a cigarette, watching the ravine along which the girl must come. The flare of the match illuminated his fleshy, unshaven features, and he was so intent that he was totally unaware of the predatory eyes that watched him out of the blue moon shadows close by. His whole existence centred on the arrival of the girl, and already he was breathing with eager little grunts of anticipation. She was like a wraith in the moonlight, silvery and ethereal, and he heaved himself to his feet and crushed out the cigarette. Annalisa, he called, his voice low and quivering with the need of her. She stopped just out of reach before him. And when he lunged for her, she danced away lightly and laughed with a mocking tinkle. Five pounds, Manir, she reminded him, and drew nearer as he fumbled the crumpled banknotes out of his back pocket. She took them and held them up to the moon. Then, satisfied, tucked them away in her clothing and stepped boldly up to him. He seized her around the waist and covered her mouth with his wet lips. She broke away at last, laughing breathlessly, and held his wrist as he reached under her skirt. 
Do you want the other pounds worth? It's too much, he panted. I haven't got that much. Ten shillings, then, she offered, and touched the front of his body with a small, cunning hand. Half a crown, he gasped. That's all I've got. And she stared at him, still touching him, and saw she could get no more out of him. All right, give it to me, she agreed, and hid the coin before she went down on her knees in front of him, as though for his blessing. He placed both hands on her curly, sun-streaked head and drew her towards him, bowing his head over her and then closing his eyes. Something hard was thrust into his ribs from behind with such force that the wind was driven from his lungs and a voice grated in his ear. Tell the little bitch to disappear. The voice was low and dangerous and dreadfully familiar. The girl leapt to her feet, wiping her mouth on the back of her hand. She stared for an instant over Forey's shoulder with wide, terrified eyes, then whirled and raced up the ravine towards the camp on long, flying legs. Forey fumbled clumsily with his clothing and turned to face the man who stood behind him with the Mauser rifle pointed at his belly. Della Ray, he blurted. Were you expecting somebody else? No, no. Forey shook his head wildly. It's just so soon. Since last they had met, Forey had had time to repent of their bargain. Cowardice had won the long battle over Avarice, and because he wanted it so, he had convinced himself that Lothar de la Rey's scheme was like so many others that he had dreamed about, merely one of those fantasies with which those forever doomed to poverty and futile labour console themselves. He had expected, and hoped, never to hear of Lothar de la Rey again, but now he stood before him, tall and deadly, with his head shining like a beacon in the moonlight and topaz lights glinting in those leopard eyes. Soon? Lothar asked. So soon? It's been weeks, my old and dear friend. It all took longer to arrange than I expected. Then Lothar's voice hardened as he asked, Have you taken the diamond shipment into Windhoek yet? No, not yet. Forey broke off, and silently reviled himself. That would have been his escape. He should have said, yes, I took it in myself last week. But it was done. And miserably he hung his head, and concentrated on fastening the last buttons of his breeches. Those few words, spoken too hastily, might yet cost him a lifetime in prison, and he was afraid. When will the shipment go in? Lothar placed the muzzle of the Mauser under Fori's chin and lifted his face to the moon. He wanted to watch the man's eyes. He did not trust him. They have delayed it. I don't know how long. I heard some rumour that they have to send in a big package of stones. Why? Lothar asked softly, and Fori shrugged. I just heard it will be a big package. As I warned you, it's because they are going to close the mine. Lothar watched his face carefully. He sensed that the man was wavering. He had to steal him. It will be the last shipment, and then you will be out of work. Just like those poor bastards you have on your trucks. Fury nodded glumly. Yes, they have fired them. And it will be you next, old friend, said Lothar. And you told me what a good family man you are, how much you love your family. Yeah. Then no more money to feed your children, no money to clothe them, not even a few pounds to pay the little girls for their clever tricks, said Lothar. Man, you mustn't talk like that, said Forey. You do what we agreed, and then there will be all the little girls you want, any way you want them. Don't talk like that. It's dirty, man. You know the arrangements, said Lothar. 
You know what to do just as soon as they tell you when the shipment is going in. Fourie nodded, but Lothar insisted, Tell me about it. Repeat it to me. And he listened, while Fourie reluctantly recited his instructions, correcting him once on a detail, and at last smiled with satisfaction. Don't let us down, old friend. I do not like to be disappointed. He leaned close to Fourie and stared into his eyes, then quite suddenly turned and slipped away into the moon shadows. Fourie shuddered and stumbled away up the ravine towards the camp like a drunkard. He was almost there before he remembered that the girl had his money, but had not completed her part of the bargain. He wondered if he could talk her into doing so at the next camp, and then morosely decided that his chances were not very good. Yet somehow it didn't seem so urgent now. The ice that Lothar de la Rey had injected into his blood seemed to have settled in his loins. They rode through the open forest below the cliffs, and their mood was carefree and gay with anticipation of the days that lay ahead. Chasser rode Presta John, with a 7mm Mannlicher sporting rifle in the leather scabbard under his left knee. It was a beautiful weapon, the butt and foregrip in choice selected walnut, and the blue steel engraved and inlaid with silver and pure gold. Hunting scenes, exquisitely rendered, and Chasser's name scripted in precious metal. The rifle had been a fourteenth birthday present from his grandfather. Santaine rode her grey stallion, a magnificent animal. His hide was marbled with black in a lacy pattern across his shoulders and croup, while his mane and muzzle and eye patches were also shiny jet black, in startling contrast to the snowy hide beneath. She called him Nuage, Cloud, after a stallion that her father had given her when she was a girl. Sontaine wore an Australian cattleman's wide-brimmed hat and a kudu-skin gilet over her shirt. There was a yellow silk scarf knotted loosely at her throat and a sparkle in her eyes. Oh, Shasa, I feel like a schoolgirl playing hooky. We've got two whole days to ourselves. Race you to the spring, he challenged her, but Presta John was no match for Nuage, and when they reached the spring, Santaine had already dismounted and was holding the stallion's head to prevent him bloating himself with water. They remounted and rode on deeper into the wilderness of the Kalahari. The further that they went from the mine, the less had been the intrusion of human presence and the wildlife more abundant and confident. Santaine had been trained in the ways of the wild by the finest of all instructors, the wild bushmen of the sand, and she had lost none of her skills. It was not only the larger game that engaged her. She pointed out a pair of quaint little bat-eared foxes that Chasser would have missed. They were hunting grasshoppers in the sparse silver grass, pricking their enormous ears as they crept forward in a pantomime of stealth before the heroic leap onto their formidable prey. They laid their telltale ears against their fluffy necks and flattened against the earth as the horses passed. They startled a yellow sand cat from an ant bear burrow, and so intent was the big cat on its escape that it ran headlong into the yellow sticky web of a crab spider. The animal's comical efforts to wipe the web from its faith with both front paws, while at the same time continuing its flight, had them both reeling in the saddle. Once in the middle of the afternoon, they spotted a herd of stately gemsbok trotting in single file across the horizon. They held their heads high, the long, straight, slender horns transformed by distance and the angle of view, into the single straight horn of the unicorn. 
the mirage turned them into strange, long-legged monsters and then swallowed them up completely. As the lowering sun painted the desert with shadow and fresh colour, Sontaine picked out another small herd of springbok and pointed out a plump young ram to Shasa. We are only half a mile from camp and we need our dinner. Eagerly Shasa drew the manlicher from its scabbard. Cleanly, she cautioned him. It troubled her a little to see how he enjoyed the chase. She stayed back and watched him dismount. Using Prester John as a stalking horse, Shasa angled in towards the herd. Prester John understood his role and kept himself between Shasa and the game, even pausing to graze when the springbok became restless, only moving closer when they had settled down again. At two hundred paces, Shasa squatted and braced his elbows on his knees, and Sontaine felt a rush of relief as the springbok ram dropped instantly to the shot. She had once seen Lothar de la Rey gut-shoot one of the lovely gazelle. The memory still haunted her. When she rode up, she saw that Shasa had hit the animal cleanly behind the shoulder, and the bullet had passed through the heart. She watched critically as Shasa dressed out the game the way Sir Gary had taught him. Keep all the offal, she told him. The servants love the tripes. So he wrapped it in the wet skin and bundled the carcass up onto Prester John's back and tied it behind the saddle. The camp was at the foot of the hills, below a seep well in the cliff which provided water. The previous day, Santaine had sent three servants ahead with the pack horses, and the camp was comfortable and secure. They dined on grilled kebabs of liver, kidneys and heart, larded with laces of fat from the springbok's belly cavity. Then they sat late at the fire, drinking coffee that tasted of wood smoke, talking quietly and watching the moon rise. In the dawn they rode out, bundled in sheepskin jackets against the chill. They had not gone a mile before Sontaine pulled up Nuage's head and leaned far out of the saddle to examine the earth. What is it, Mater? Shasa was always sensitive to every nuance of her moods, and he saw how excited she was. Come quickly, Sherry. She pointed out the tracks in the soft earth. What do you make of these? Human beings? He was puzzled. But so small. Children? He looked up at her, and her shining expression gave him the clue. Bushman! he exclaimed. Wild Bushman! Oh, yes, she laughed. A pair of hunters. They are after a giraffe. Look! Their tracks are overlaying those of the quarry. Can we follow them, Mater? Can we? Now Shasa was excited as she was. Santin agreed. Their spoor is only a day old. We can catch them if we hurry. Santin rode on the spoor, with Shasa trailing behind her careful not to spoil the sign. He had never seen her work like this, taking it at a canter over the bad places, where even his sharp young eyes could see nothing. Look, a bushman toothbrush. She pointed to a fresh twig, the end chewed to a brush, that lay discarded beside the spoor, and they rode on. This is where they first spotted the giraffe, "'How do you know that?' asked Shasa. "'They have strung their bows. "'There are the marks of the butts.' "'The little men had pressed the tips of their bows "'against the earth to arch them. "'Look, Shasa, now they have begun stalking.' "'He could see no change in the spoor and said so. "'Shorter and stealthier paces. "'Wait forward on the toes,' she explained. "'And then a few hundred paces farther, here they went down on their bellies, snake crawling in for the kill. Here they went up on their knees to loose their arrows, and here they leapt at their feet to watch them strike. Twenty paces farther on, she exclaimed, 
See how close they were to the quarry. This is where the giraffe felt the sting of the barbs and started to gallop. Look how the hunters followed at a run, waiting for the poison of the arrows to take effect. They galloped along the line of the chase until Santaine rose in the stirrups and pointed ahead. Vultures! Four or five miles ahead, the blue of the heavens was dusted with a fine cloud of black specks. The cloud turned in slow vortex, high above the earth. Slowly now, Sherry, Santaine cautioned him. It could be dangerous if we frighten and panic them. They brought the horses down to a walk and rode slowly up to the side of the kill. The giraffe's huge carcass, partly flayed and dismembered, lay on its side. Against the surrounding thorn bushes, crude sun shelters of thatch had been erected, and the bushes were festooned with strips of meat and ribbons of entrails set out to dry in the sun. The branches bowed under their weight. The area was widely trodden by small feet. They have brought the women and children to help them cut up and carry, Santaine said. Pooh, it pongs terribly, Shasa screwed up his nose. Where are they anyway? Hiding, Santaine said. They saw us coming probably from five miles away. She stood up in the stirrups and swept the broad-brimmed hat from her head to show her face more clearly and she called out in a strange, guttural, clicking tongue, turning slowly and repeating the message to every quarter of the silent, brooding desert that encompassed them. It's creepy. Shasa shivered involuntary in the bright sunlight. Are you sure they're still here? They're watching us, said Santaine. They aren't in a hurry. Then a man rose out of the earth so close to them that the stallion shied and nodded his head nervously. The man wore only a loincloth of animal skin. He was a small man, yet perfectly formed, with elegant and graceful limbs built for running. Hard muscle lay flat down his chest and sculpted his naked belly into the same ripples that the ebb tide leaves on a sandy beach. He held his head proudly, and though he was clean-shaven, it was evident he was in the full flowering of his manhood. His eyes had a Mongolian slant to the corners, and his skin glowed with a marvellous amber colour, seeming almost translucent in the sunlight. He lifted his right hand in a greeting and a sign of peace, and he called, bird-like and high, "'I see you, Nam child!' using Santaine's bushman name, and she cried out aloud for joy. I see you also, Qui. Who is with you? the bushman demanded. This is my son, Good Water, said Santaine. As I told you when first we met, he was born in the holy place of your people, and Owa was his adopted grandfather, and Hani was his grandmother. Kui, the bushman, turned and called out into the empty desert. This is the truth, O people of the San. This woman is Nam Child, our friend, and the boy is he of the legend. Greet them. Out of the seemingly barren earth against which they had hidden rose the little golden people of the San. With Kui, there were twelve of them. Two men, Kui and his brother Fat Kui, their wives and the naked children. They had hidden with all the art of wild creatures, but now they crowded forward, chirruping and clicking and laughing, and Santaine swung down from the saddle to meet and embrace them, greeting each one of them by name and finally picking up two of the toddlers and holding one on each hip. How do you know them so well, Mater? Shasa wanted to know. Kui and his brother are related to Oa, your adopted Bushman grandfather. I first met them when you were very small, and we were developing the Hani mine. These are their hunting grounds. They passed the rest of that day with the clan, and when it was time to leave, 
Santane gave each of the women a handful of brass seven millimeter cartridges, and they shrieked with joy and danced their thanks. The cartridges would be strung with ostrich shell beads into necklaces that would make them the envy of every other San woman they met in their wandering. Shasa gave Kui his ivory handled hunting knife, and the little man tried the edge with his thumb and grunted with wonder as the skin parted. And he displayed the bloody thumb proudly to each of the women. What a weapon I have now! Fat Kui got Santane's belt, and they left him studying the reflection of his own face in the polished brass buckle. If you wish to visit us again, Kui called after them, we will be at the Mongogo tree near Ochi Pan until the rains break. They are so happy with so little, Shasa said, looking back at the tiny dancing figures. They are the happiest people in this earth, Santen agreed, but I wonder for how much longer. Did you truly live like that, Mater? Shasa asked, like a bushman? Did you really wear skins and eat roots? So did you, Shasa, she said. Or rather, you wore nothing at all, just like one of those grubby little scamps. He frowned with the effort of memory. Sometimes I dream about a dark place, like a cave with water that smoked. That was the thermal spring in which we bathed, and in which I found the first diamond of the Harney mine, said Sontaine. I would like to visit it again, Mater. That isn't possible, she said, and he saw her mood change. The spring was in the centre of the Harney pipe, in what is now the main excavation of the mine. We dug it out and destroyed the spring. They rode on in silence for a while. It was the holy place of the San, and yet, strangely, they did not seem to resent it when we. She hesitated over the word and then said it firmly, when we desecrated it. I wonder why," said Chasser. "I mean, if some strange race turned Westminster Abbey into a diamond mine." A long time ago, I discussed it with Qui. She said, "He said that the secret place belonged not to them but to the spirits, and if the spirits had not wanted it so, they would have not let it happen." He said the spirits had lived there so long that perhaps they were bored and wished to move on to another home, just like the San do. I still cannot imagine you living like one of the San women, Mater. Not you. I mean, it just goes beyond imagination. It was hard," she said softly. "It was hard beyond the telling of it, beyond imagination. And yet, without that tempering and toughening, I would not be what I am now. You see, Shasa, out here in the desert, when I had almost reached the breaking point, I swore an oath. I swore that I and my son would never again be so deprived. I swore that we would never again have to suffer those terrible extremes. But I was not with you then," said Shasa. "Oh yes," she nodded. "Oh yes, you were. I carried you within me on the skeleton coast and through the heat of the dune lands." And you were part of that oath when I made it. We are creatures of the desert, my darling, and we will survive and prosper when others fail and fall. Remember that. Remember it well, Shasa, my darling. Early the next morning, they left the servants to break camp, load the pack horses. And follow them as they turned their horses regretfully in the direction of the Harney mine. At noon, they rested under a camel thorn tree, lying against their saddles and lazily watching the drab little weavers above their heads, busily adding to their communal nest 
that was already the size of an untidy haystack. When the heat went out of the sun, they caught the hobbled horses, upsaddled, and rode along the base of the hills. Shasa straightened in the saddle suddenly and shaded his eyes with one hand as he looked up at the hills. What is it, Cherry? Santain asked. He had recognized the rocky gorge to which Annalisa had led him. Something is worrying you, Santain insisted, and Shasa felt a sudden urge to lead his mother up the gorge to the shrine of the Witch of the Mountain. He was about to speak when he remembered his oath, and he stopped, teetering uneasily on the brink of betrayal. Don't you want to tell me? She was watching the struggle on his face. Mater doesn't count. She's like me. It's not as though I were telling a stranger. He justified himself, and burst out before his conscience could overtake him. There is the skeleton of a bushman in the gorge up there, Mater. Would you like me to show you? Santaine paled under her suntan, and stared at him. A bushman, she whispered. How do you know it's a bushman? The hair is still on the skull, he said. Little bushman peppercorn curls, just like Qui and his clan. How did you find it? She asked. Anna, he broke off and flushed with guilt. The girl showed you. Santain helped him. Yes, he nodded and hung his head. Can you find it again? Santain's colour had returned, and she seemed eager and excited as she leaned across and tugged his sleeve. Yes, I think so. I marked the place. He pointed up the cliffs. That notch in the rocks and that cleft shaped like an eye. Show me, Shasha. She ordered, "We will have to leave the horses and go up on foot." The climb was onerous, the heat in the gorge fierce, and the hooked thorns snatched at them as they toiled upwards. It must be about here. Shasa climbed up one of the tumbled boulders and orientated himself. Perhaps just a little more to the left. Look for a pile of rock with a mimosa growing below it. There is a branch covering a small niche. Let's spread out and search. They picked their way slowly up the gorge, moving a little apart to cover more ground and keeping in touch with whistles and calls when scrub and rock separated them. Sontaine did not respond to Shasta's whistle, and he stopped and repeated it, cocking his head for her reply. And feeling a prickle of concern in the silence. Mater, where are you? Here. Her voice was faint, racked with pain or some deep emotion, and he scrambled over the rock to reach her. She stood, small and forlorn in the sunlight, holding her hat against the front of her hips. Moisture sparkled on her cheeks. He thought it was sweat. Until he saw the soft, slow slide of tears down her face. Mater. He moved up behind her and realized that she had found the shrine. She had drawn the screening branch aside. The small circle of glass jars was still in place, the floral offering brown and withered. Anna Lisa said the skeleton was a witch. Shasta breathed with superstitious awe, as he stared over Santain's shoulder at the pathetic pile of bones, and the small, neat white skull that surmounted it. Santain shook her head, unable to speak. She said the witch guarded the mountain, and that she would grant a wish. Hani. Santain choked on the name. My beloved old mother, Mater. Shasta seized her shoulders and steadied her, as she swayed on her feet. How do you know? Santain leaned against his chest for support, but did not reply. 
There could be hundreds of Bushman skeletons in the caves and gorges, he went on lamely, and she shook her head vehemently. How can you be certain? he asked. It's her. Santaine's voice was blurred with grief. It's Harney, the chimped canine tooth, the design of ostrich shell beads on her loincloth. Shazza had not noticed the scrap of dry leather decorated with beads that lay beneath the pile of bones, half buried in dust. I don't even need that proof. I know it's her. I just know it. Sit down, Meter. He lowered her to sit on one of the lichen covered boulders. I'm all right now. It's just such a shock. I've searched for her so often over the years. I knew where she must be. She looked around her vaguely. Oa's body must be somewhere close at hand. She looked up at the cliff that seemed to hang over them like a cathedral roof. They were up there trying to escape when he gunned them down. They must have fallen close together. Who shot them, Mater? She drew a deep breath, but even then her voice shook as she said his name. Lothar. Lothar de la Rey. For an hour longer they searched the bottom and sides of the gorge, looking for the second skeleton. It's no good, Santaine gave up at last. We will never find him. Let him lie undisturbed, Chasseur, as he has all these years. They climbed down to the little rock shrine, and as they returned, they plucked the wild flowers along the way. My first instinct was to gather her remains and give them a decent burial, Santaine whispered as she knelt in front of the shrine. But Harney wasn't a Christian. These hills were her holy place. She will be at peace here. She arranged the flowers with care and then sat back on her heels. I'll see that you are never disturbed, my beloved old grandmother, and I will come to visit you again. She stood up and took Shasa's hand. She was the finest, gentlest person. I have ever known, she said softly, and I loved her so. Still hand in hand, they went down to where they had tethered the horses. They did not speak again on the ride home, and the sun had set, and the servants were anxious by the time they reached the bungalow. At breakfast the next morning, Santaine was brisk and brittly cheerful, though there were dark bruised smudges beneath her eyes, and the lids were puffed from weeping. This is our last week before we must return to Cape Town, she said. I wish we could stay here forever. Forever is a long time, Chasse. You have school waiting for you, and I have my duties. We will come back here, you know that. He nodded, and she went on. I have arranged for you to spend this last week working in the washing plant and sorting rooms. You'll enjoy that, I guarantee it. She was right, as usual. The washing plant was a pleasant place. The flow of water over the whiffle boards cooled the air, and after the unremitting thunder of the mill plant, it was blessedly quiet. The atmosphere in the long brick room was like the cathedral calm of a holy place, for here the worship of mammon and adamant reached its climax. Chasse watched with fascination as the crushings from the mill plant were carried in on the slowly moving conveyor belt. The oversized rubble had been screened off and returned for another crushing under the spinning rollers. These were the fines. They dropped from the end of the moving belt into the puddling tank, 
and from there were pushed by the agitating arms of the revolving sweep down the sloping boards of the wiffle table. The lighter materials floated away and were run off to the waste dump. The heavier gravels containing the diamonds were carried on through a series of similar ingenious separating devices until there remained only the concentrates, one thousandth part of the original gravels. These were washed over the grease drums. The drums revolved slowly, each of them coated with a thick layer of heavy yellow grease. The wet gravel flowed easily over the surface, but the diamonds were dry. One of the diamond's peculiar qualities is its unwettability. Soak it, boil it as long as you wish, but it remains dry. Once the dry surface of the precious stones touch the grease, they stuck to it like insects to flypaper. The grease drums were locked behind heavy bars, and a white supervisor sat overlooking each of them, watching them constantly. Chassa peered through the bars for the first time and saw the small miracle occur only a few inches from his nose. A wild diamond captured and tamed like some marvellous creature of the desert. He actually witnessed the moment when it flowed out of the upper bin in a wet porridge of gravel, and he saw it touch the grease and adhere precariously to the slick yellow surface, causing a tiny V-shaped disturbance to the flow, like a rock in the ebb of the tide. It moved, seeming to lose its grip in the grease for an instant, and Chassa wanted to thrust out his hand and seize it before it was forever lost. But the gaps between the steel bars were too narrow. Then the diamond stuck fast and breasted the gentle flood of gravel, sitting up proudly, dry and transparent, like a blister on the yellow skin of a gigantic reptile. It left him with a feeling of awe the same feelings as he had experienced when he witnessed his mare Celeste give birth to her first foal. He spent the entire morning passing from one to the other of the huge yellow drums, and then back again down the line, watching the diamonds sticking on the grease more and more thickly with each hour that passed. At noon the washroom manager came down the line with his four white assistants, more than were necessary, other than to watch each other and forestall any opportunity for theft. With a broad-bladed spatula, they scraped the grease from the drums and collected it in the boiling pot, then meticulously spread each drum with a fresh coating of yellow grease. In the locked degreasing room at the far end of the building, the manager placed the steel pot on the spirit stove and boiled off the grease, until finally he was left with a pot half full of diamonds. And Dr. Twentyman Jones was there to weigh each stone separately and record it in the leather-bound recovery book. Of course, you will notice, Master Chasser, that none of these stones is smaller than half a carat. Yes, sir. Chasser had not thought of that. What happened to the smaller ones? The grease table is not infallible. Indeed, the stones must have a certain minimum weight to get them to adhere. The others, even a few large valuable stones, pass across the table. He led Chassa back to the washroom and showed him the trough of wet gravel that had survived the journey over the drums. We drain all the water and reuse it. Out here, water is precious stuff, as you know. Then all the gravel has to be hand-picked. As he spoke, two men emerged from the door at the end of the room, and each scooped a bucket of gravel from the trough. Chassa and Twentyman Jones followed them back through the doorway into a long, narrow room, well lit with glass skylights and high windows. A single, long table ran the length of the room, its top clad in a polished metal sheet. On each side of the table sat rows of women. They looked up as the two men entered, and Chassa recognized the wives and daughters of many of the white workers as well as those of the black boss boys. The white women sat together nearest the door, and with a decent and proper distance between them, the black women sat separated at the far end of the room. 
The bucket boys dumped the damp gravel onto the metal table, and the women transferred their attention back to it. Each had a pair of forceps in one hand and a flat wooden scoop in the other. They drew a little of the gravel towards them, spread it with the scoop, and then picked over it swiftly. It's a job at which the women excel, Twentyman Jones explained as they passed down the line, watching over the stooped shoulders of the women. They have the patience and the sharp eyes and the dexterity that men lack. Shasser saw that they were picking out tiny opaque stones, some as small as sugar grains, others the size of small green peas, from the duller mass of gravel. Those are our bread and butter stones, Twentyman Jones remarked. They are used in industry. The jewellery grade stones that you saw in the grease room are the strawberry jam and the cream. When the mine hooter signalled the end of the day shift, Chasser rode down with Twentyman Jones in the front seat of his Ford from the washing gear to the office block. On his lap he carried the small locked steel box in which was the day's recovery. Santaine met them on the veranda of the administration building and led them into her office. Well, did you find it interesting, she asked, and smiled at Chasser's hearty response. It was fascinating, Mater, and we got one real beauty, 36 carats. It's a jolly great monster of a diamond. He set the box on her desk, and when Twentyman Jones unlocked it, he showed her the diamond as proudly as if he had mined it with his own hands. It's big, Santaine agreed, but the colour isn't particularly good. There, hold it to the light. See, it's as brown as whiskey and soda. And even with the naked eye, you can see the inclusions and flaws, those little black specks inside the stone, and that tear through the middle. Chasser looked crestfallen that his stone was so denigrated, and she laughed and turned to Twentyman Jones. Let's show him some really good diamonds. Will you open the vault, please, Dr. Twentyman Jones? Twentyman Jones pulled out the bunch of keys from the fob pocket of his waistcoat and led Chasser down the passage to the steel grill door at the end. He opened it with his key and relocked it behind them before they went down the stairs to the underground vault. Even from Chasser, he screened the lock with his body as he tumbled the combination and then used a second key before the thick green chub steel door swung ponderously aside and they went into the strong room. The industrial grade stones are kept in these canisters. He touched them as he passed. But we keep the high grade stuff separately. He unlocked the smaller steel door set in the rear wall of the vault and selected five numbered brown paper packages from the crowded shelf. These are our best stones. He handed them to Chasser as a mark of his trust, and then they went back again, opening and relocking each door as they passed through. Santaine was waiting for them in her office, and when Chasser placed the packages in front of her, she opened the first and gently spread the contents on her blotter. Golly gee! Chasser goggled at the array of large stones glittering with a soapy sheen. They are ginormous. Let's ask Dr. Twentyman Jones to give us a dissertation, Santaine suggested, and hiding his gratification behind a sombre countenance, he picked up one of the gemstones. Well, Master Chasser, here is a diamond in its natural crystalline formation, the octahedron of eight faces. Count them. Here is another, in a more complicated crystalline form, the dodecahedron of twelve faces, while these others are massive and uncrystallized. See how rounded and amorphous they are. Diamonds come in many guises. He laid each in Chasser's open palm. 
and not even his prim, monotonous recital could dull the fascination of this shining treasure. The diamond has a perfect cleavage, or as we call it, grain, and can be split in all four directions, parallel to the octahedral crystal planes. That's how the cutters cleave a stone before polishing, Santin cut in. During your next holidays, I will take you to Amsterdam, so you can see it done. This rather greasy sheen will disappear when the stones are cut and polished. Twentyman Jones took over again, resenting her intrusion. Then all their fire will be revealed as their very high refractive power captures the light within and dispersive powers separate it into the spectral colours. How much does this one weigh? asked Shasser. Forty-eight carats, Santain consulted the recovery book. But remember, it may lose more than half its weight when it is cut and polished. Then how much will it be worth? asked Shasser. Santain glanced at Twentyman Jones. A great deal of money, Master Shasser. Like the true lover of any beautiful object, gem or painting, horse or statue, he disliked placing a monetary value upon it. So he hedged and returned to his lecture. Now I want you to compare the colours of these stones. Darkness fell outside the windows, but Santain switched on the lights and they huddled over the small pile of stones for another hour, meeting question with answer and talking quietly and intently, until at last Twentyman Jones swept the stones back into their packages and stood up. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, he quoted unexpectedly. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He stopped and looked self-conscious. Forgive me, I don't know what got into me. Ezekiel? Santain asked, smiling fondly at him. Chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. He nodded, trying not to show how impressed he was by her knowledge. I'll put these away now. Dr. Twentyman Jones, Shessa stopped him. You didn't answer my question. How much are these stones worth? Are you referring to the entire package? He looked uncomfortable including the industrials and bought still in the strong room. Yes, sir. How much, sir? Well, if De Beers accepts them at the same price as our, as our last package, they will fetch considerably in excess of a million pounds sterling, he replied sadly. A million pounds, Chessa repeated. But Santain saw in his expression that such a figure was incomprehensible to him, like the astronomical distances between stars that must be expressed in light years. He will learn, she thought. I will teach him. Remember, Shasa, that is not all profit, she said. From that sum we will have to pay all the expenses of the mine over the past months before we can figure a profit. And even from that, we have to give the tax collectors their pound of bleeding flesh. She stood up behind the desk and then held out her hand to prevent Twentyman Jones leaving the room, as an idea struck her. As you know, Shasser and I are going into Windhoek this coming Friday. Shasser has to return to school at the end of next week. I will take the diamonds into the bank with me in the Daimler. Mrs. Courtney, Twentyman Jones was horrified. I couldn't allow that. A million pounds worth, good Lord alive. It would be criminally irresponsible of me to agree. He broke off 
as he saw her expression alter. Her mouth settled into that familiar, stubborn shape, and the lights of battle glinted in her eyes. He knew her so well, like his own daughter, and loved her as much. He realized that he had made the grievous error of challenging and forbidding her. He knew what her reaction must be, and he sought desperately to head her off. I was only thinking of you, Mrs. Courtney. A million pounds of diamonds would attract every scavenger and predator, every robber and footpad for a thousand miles around. It was not my intention to broach it abroad. I will not broadcast it a thousand miles around, she said coldly. The insurance, inspiration came to him at last. The insurance will not cover losses if the package is not sent in by armed convoy. Can you truly afford to take that chance? A loss of a million pounds of revenue against a few days saved? He had hit upon the one argument that might stop her. He saw her thinking about it carefully. A chance of losing a million pounds against a mim minimal loss of face and he sighed silently with relief when she shrugged. Oh, very well then, Dr. Twentyman Jones, have it your own way. Lothar had carved the road to Harney Mine through the desert with his own hands, and sprinkled every mile of it with the sweat of his brow. But that had been twelve years before, and now his memory of it had grown hazy. Still, he remembered half a dozen points along the road which might serve his purpose. From the stage camp where he had intercepted Gerhard Fori's convoy, they followed the rutted track south and west in the direction of Windhoek, travelling at night to save them from discovery by unexpected traffic on the road. On the second morning, just as the sun was rising, Lothar reached one of the points he remembered and found it ideal. Here the road ran parallel to the deep rocky bed of a dry river before looping down through the deep cutting that Lothar had excavated to cross the river bed and climb out the far side through another cutting. He dismounted and walked out along the edge of the high bank to study it carefully. They could trap the diamond truck in the gut of the cutting and block it with rocks rolled down from the top of the bank. There was certain to be water under the sand in the riverbed for the horses while they waited for the truck to show up. They would need to keep in condition for the long, hard journey ahead. The riverbed would hide them. Then again, this was the remotest stretch of the road. It would take days for the police officers to be alerted and then to reach the ambush spot. He could certainly expect to establish an early and convincing lead, even if they chose the risky alternative of following him into the hard, unrelenting wilderness across which he would retreat. This is where we will do it, he told Swart Hendrick. They set up their primitive camp in the sheer bank of the river bed, at the point where the telegraph line took the short cut across the loop in the road. The copper wires were strung over the riverbed from a pole on the near bank that was out of sight of the road. Lothar climbed the pole and clipped on his taps to the main telegraph line, then led his wires down the pole, tacking them to the timber to avoid casual discovery, and then to his listening post in the dugout that Swart Hendrick had burrowed into the bank of the river. The waiting was monotonous and Lothar chafed at being tied to the earphones of the telegraph tap. But he could not afford to miss the vital message when it was flashed from the Harney mine, the message which would give him the exact departure time of the diamond truck. So, during the dreary, hot hours of daylight, he had to listen to all the mundane traffic of the mine's daily business. And the distant operator's skills on the keyboard were such that they taxed his ability to follow and translate the rapid fire of dots and dashes that echoed in his earphones. 
He scribbled them into his notebook and afterwards translated the groups and jotted in the words between the lines. This was a private telegraph line, and therefore no effort had been made to encode the transmission. The traffic was in clear. During the day, he was alone in the dugout. Svort Hendrik took Manfred and the horses out in the desert, ostensibly to hunt, but really to school and harden both the boy and the animals for the journey that lay ahead and to keep them out of sight of any traffic on the road. For Lothar, the long, monotonous days were full of doubts and foreboding. There was so much that could go wrong, so many details that had to mesh perfectly to ensure success. There were weak links, and Gerhard Furi was the weakest of these. The whole plan hinged on the man, and he was a coward a man easily distracted and discouraged. Waiting is always the worst time, Lothar thought, and he remembered the fears that had assailed him on the eve of other battles and desperate endeavours. If you could just do it and have done with it, instead of having to sit out these dragging days. Suddenly the buzz of the call sign echoed in his earphones and he reached quickly for his notebook. The operator at the Harney mine began to transmit and Lothar's pencil danced across the pages as he kept up with him. There was a curt double tap of acknowledgement from the Windhoek station as the message ended and Lothar let the earphones drop around his neck as he translated the groups. For Pettifogger... Prepare Juno's private coach for inclusion in the Sunday Night Express mail train to Cape Town. Stop. Juno arriving your end, noon Sunday. Ends, Vant. Pettifogger was Abraham Abrahams. Santaine must have selected that code name when she was annoyed with him, while Vant was a pun on Twentyman Jones's name. The French connotation suggested Santaine's influence again. But Lothar wondered who had selected Juno as Santaine Courtney's codename and grimaced at how appropriate it was. So, Santaine was leaving for Cape Town in her private coach. Somehow he felt guilty relief that she would not be close at hand when it happened, as though distance might lessen the shock for her. To reach Windhoek comfortably by noon on Sunday, Sontaine must leave the Harney mine early on Friday, he calculated quickly. That would bring her to the cutting here on the river bank on Saturday afternoon. Then he deducted a few hours from his estimate. She drove that Daimler like a demon. He sat in the hot, stuffy little dugout, and suddenly he felt an overwhelming desire to see her again to have just a glimpse of her as she passed. We can use it as a rehearsal for the diamond truck, he justified himself. The Daimler came out of the shimmering distances, like one of the whirling dust devils of the hot desert moons. Lothar saw the dust column from ten miles or more and signalled Manfred and Svort Hendrik into their positions at the top of the cutting. They had dug shallow trenches at the key points, scattering the disturbed earth and letting the dry breeze smooth and blend it with the surroundings. Then they had screened the positions with branches of, of thorn scrub until Lothar was satisfied that they were undetectable from further than a few paces. The rocks with which they would block both ends of the cutting had been gathered laboriously from the river bed and poised on the edge of the bank. Lothar had taken great care to make them seem natural, and yet a single slash with a knife across the rope that held the prop under the rock pile would send them tumbling down onto the narrow track at the bottom of the cutting. This was a rehearsal, so none of them were wearing masks. Lothar made one last hard scrutiny of the arrangements and then turned back to watch the swiftly approaching column of dust. 
It was already close enough for him to make out the tiny shape of the vehicle beneath it and hear the faint beat of its engine. She shouldn't drive like that, he thought angrily. She'll kill herself. He broke off and shook his head ruefully. I'm acting like a doting husband, he realised. Let her break her damned neck if that's what she wants. Yet the idea of her death gave him a painful pang, and he crossed his fingers to turn the chance away. Then he crouched down in his trench and watched her through the screen of thorn brambles and branches. The stately vehicle rocked and bounced over the tracks as it swung onto the loop of the road. The engine beat strengthened as Santane changed down and then accelerated out of the turn, using power to pull out of the incipient skid as the flowery dust clutched at the front wheels. It was done with the lan, he thought grudgingly, as she hit the gears again and bore down on the head of the cutting at speed. Merciful God, is she going to take it at full bore, he wondered. But at the last moment, she cut the throttle and used the gearbox and the drag of the clinging dust to pull up at the top end of the cutting. As she opened the door and stepped out onto the running board with the dust billowing around her, she was only twenty paces from where he lay, and he felt his heart banging against the earth. Can she still do this to me? he wondered at himself. I should hate her. She had cheated and humiliated me, and she has spurned my son and denied him a mother's love. And yet, and yet, he would not let the words form, and he tried deliberately to harden himself against her. She's not beautiful, he told himself as he studied her face. But she was much more. She was vital and vibrant, and there was an aura about her. Juno, he recalled the code name, the goddess. Powerful and dangerous, mercurial and unpredictable, but endlessly fascinating and infinitely desirable. She looked directly towards him for a moment, and he felt the strength and resolve flow out of him at the touch of those dark eyes. But she had not seen him, and she turned away. We will walk down, Cherie, she called to the young man who stepped out of the opposite side of the Daimler, to see if the crossing is safe. Shasa seemed to have grown inches in the short time since Lothar had last seen him. They left the vehicle and went side by side down the track below where Lothar lay. Manfred was in his trench at the bottom end of the cutting. He also watched the pair come down the track. The woman meant nothing to him. She was his mother, but he did not know that, and there was, n there was no instinctive response within him. She had never given him suck or even held him in her arms. She was a stranger, and he glanced at her without any emotion, then turned all his attention to the youth at her side. Shasser's good looks offended him. He's as pretty as a girl, he thought, trying to scorn him. But he saw the new breadth to his rival's shoulders and fine muscle in his brown arms, where he had rolled his sleeves high. I would like another bout with you, my friend. The almost forgotten sting and humiliation of Shasser's left fist hurt again like a fresh wound, and he touched his own face with his fingertips, scowling at the memory. Next time I won't let you do your little dance. And he thought about how hard it had been to touch that pretty face, the way it had swayed and dipped just beyond his reach, and he felt the frustration anew. The couple reached the foot of the cutting below where Manfred lay, and stood talking quietly for a while. Then Shasa trudged out into the wide river bed. The roadway through the sand had been corduroyed with branches of acacia, but the wheels of heavy trucks had broken them up. Shasa rearranged them, stamping the jagged ends into the sand. 
While he worked, Santaine turned back to the Daimler. There was a canvas water bag hanging on the bracket of the spare wheel, and she unhooked it, raised it to her lips, and took a mouthful. She gargled softly, and then spat it into the dust. Then she slipped off the long white dust jacket that protected her clothing, and unbuttoned her blouse. She soaked the yellow scarf and wiped the damp cloth down her throat and over her bosom, gasping with pleasure at the coolness on her skin. Lothar wanted to turn his head away, but he could not. Instead, he stared at her. She wore nothing under the pale blue cotton blouse. The skin of her bosom was untouched by the sun. Pale, smooth, and pearly as fine bone china. Her breasts were small, without any puckering and sagging. The tips pointed and still clear, rose-coloured as those of a girl, not of a woman who had borne two sons. They bounced elastically as she drew the wet scarf over them, and she looked down at them as she bathed the gleam of perspiration from them. Lothar moaned softly in his throat, at the need of her that rose freshly and strongly from deep within him. All set, Mater," Shasa called as he started back up the track, and quickly Santaine rebuttoned the front of her blouse. "We've wasted enough time," she agreed, and slipped back behind the wheel of the Daimler. As Shasa slammed his door, she gunned the big motor down the track. Kicking up sand and splinters of acacia in a spray from the back wheels, as she crossed the riverbed and flew up the far bank. The rumble of the engine dwindled into the desert silence, and Lothar found he was trembling. None of them moved for many minutes. It was Fort Hendrik who rose to his feet first. He opened his mouth to speak, and then saw the expression on Lothar's face. And remained silent. He scrambled down the bank, and set off back towards the camp. Lothar climbed down to the spot where the Daimler had stopped. He stood, looking down at the damp earth, where she had spat that mouthful of water. Her footprints were narrow and neat in the dust, and he felt a strong urge to scoop and touch them. But suddenly, Manfred spoke close behind him. He is a boxer, he said, and it took Lothar a moment to realize that he was talking about Shasser. He looks a real sissy, but he can fight. You can't hit him. He put up his fists and shadow boxed, shuffling and dancing in the dust, imitating Shasser. Let's get back to the camp out of sight, Lothar said. And Manfred dropped his guard and thrust his hands into his pockets. Neither of them spoke again until they reached the dugout. Can you box, Pa? Manfred asked. Can you teach me to box? Lothar smiled and shook his head. I always found it easier to kick a man between his legs, he said, and then hit him with a bottle or a gun butt. I would like to learn to box, Manfred said. Some day I will learn. Perhaps the idea had been germinating there all along, but suddenly it was a firm declaration. His father smiled indulgently and clapped him on the shoulder. Get out the flour bag, he said, and I will teach you to bake soda bread instead. Oh, Abe, you know how much I detest these soirees," Santaine exclaimed irritably. "Crowded rooms filled with tobacco smoke, exchanging inanities with strangers. This man could be very valuable to know, Santaine. I will go further than that; he could be the most valuable friend you'll ever make in this territory." Santaine pulled a face. Abe was right, of course. The administrator was, in fact, the governor of the territory with wide executive powers. He was appointed by the government of the Union of South Africa, under the powers of mandate conferred on it by the Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles.
It of Versailles. It of Versailles. It of Versailles. It of Versailles. I expect he is another pompous old bore, just like his predecessor was, said Sontaine. I haven't met him, Aby admitted. He only arrived in Windhoek to take up his appointment within the last few days and will not be sworn in until the first of next month. But our new concessions in the Sumeb area are on his desk at this moment, awaiting his signature. He saw her eyes shift and he pressed the advantage. Two thousand square miles of exclusive prospecting rights. Worth a few hours of boredom? But she wouldn't give in that easily, and she counterattacked. We are due to hook onto the express that leaves this evening. Chassa must be back at Bishop's on Wednesday morning. Santaine stood up and paced the saloon of her coach, stopping to rearrange the roses in the vase above her desk, so she did not have to look at him as he deflected her thrust. The next express leaves Tuesday evening. I have made arrangements for your coach to hook on. Master Chasser can leave on this evening's express. I have booked a coupe for him. Sir Gary and his wife are still at Ventivraden. They would meet him at Cape Town Station. It needs only a telegraph to arrange it. Abraham smiled across the saloon at Chasser. I am sure, young man, you can make the journey without anyone to hold your hand. A.B. was a cunning little devil, Santaine conceded, as Chasser rushed indignantly to take up the challenge. Of course I can, Mater. You stay here. It's important to meet the new administrator. I can get home on my own. Anna will help me pack for school. Santaine threw up her hands. If I die of boredom, A.B., let it be on your conscience for as long as you live. She had at first planned to wear her full suite of diamonds, but decided against it at the last moment. After all, it's only a little provincial reception, with fat farmers' wives and petty civil servants. Besides, I don't want to blind the poor old dear. So she settled for a yellow silk evening dress by Coco Chanel. She had worn it before, but in Cape Town, so it was unlikely anybody here had seen it. It was expensive enough to bear two airings, she consoled herself. Too good for them, anyway. She settled on a pair of solitaire diamond ear studs, not too large to be ostentatious, but around her neck she wore the huge yellow diamond, the colour of champagne, on a platinum chain. It drew attention to her small pointed breasts. She liked the effect. Her hair was a worry, as always. It was full of electricity from the dry desert air. She wished Anna was here, for she was the only one who could manage that lustrous, unruly bush. In despair, she tried to make a virtue of its disorder, deliberately fluffing it out into a halo and holding it up with a velvet band around her forehead. That's enough fuss. She didn't feel like a party at all. Chasser had left on the mail train, as Aby had planned, and already she was missing him keenly. On top of that, she was anxious to get back to Velt of Raiden herself, and resented having to stay over. Aby called for her an hour after the time stipulated on the invitation card that was embossed with the administrator's coat of arms. During the drive, Rachel, Aby's wife, regaled them with an account of her recent domestic triumphs and tragedies, including a detailed report of her youngest offspring's bowel movements. The administrative building, the Ink Palace, had been designed by the German colonial administration in heavy Gothic imperial style. When Santaine swept a glance around the ballroom, she saw that the company was no better than she had expected. It comprised of mainly senior civil servants, heads and deputy heads of departments with their wives, the officers of the local garrison and police force, together with all the town's prominent businessmen and the big landowners, who lived close enough to Windhoek to respond to the invitation. Among them were a number of Santaine's own people, 
all the managers and under-managers of the Courtney Finance and Mining Company. Amy had provided her with an up-to-date bulletin, so that as each came forward, diffidently, to present their spouses, Sontaine was able to make some gracious personal comment, which had them glowing and grinning with gratification. Amy stood by to make sure that none of them imposed upon her, and after the appropriate interval gave her the excuse to escape. I think we should pay our respects to the new administrator, Mrs. Courtney. He took her arm and led her towards the reception line. I have been able to get a few facts about him. He is a Lieutenant Colonel Blaine Malcolmus and commanded a battalion of the Natal Mountain Rifles. He had a good war and ended with a bar to his military cross. In private life, he is a lawyer and... The police band was belting out a Strauss waltz with zeal and gusto, and the dance floor was already crowded. As they came up to the tail of the reception line, Sontaine saw with satisfaction that they would be the last to be presented. Sontaine was paying little attention to their host at the head of the line as she moved along on Aby's arm, leaning across him to listen to Rachel on his other arm, who was giving her a family recipe for chicken soup. But at the same time, Sontaine was trying to decide just how early she could make her escape. Abruptly she realised that they had reached the end of the line, the very last to do so, and that the administrator's ADC was announcing them to their host. Mr. and Mrs. Abraham Abrahams and Mrs. Sontaine de Thierry Courtenay. She looked up at the man who stood before her, and involuntarily she dug her fingernails into the soft inside of Abraham Abraham's elbow with such force that he winced. She did not notice it, for she was staring at Colonel Blaine Malcolmus. He was tall and lean, and he stood well over six feet. His bearing was relaxed without any military stiffness, and yet he seemed to be balanced on the balls of his feet as though he could explode into movement at any moment. Mrs. Courtney, he offered her his hand. I am delighted you were able to come. You were the one person I particularly wanted to meet. His voice was a clear tenor, with a faint lilt to it that might have been Welsh. An educated and cultivated voice, with modulations which lifted a little electric rash of pleasure on her forearms and at the nape of her neck. She took his hand. The skin was dry and warm, and she could feel the restrained strength of his fingers as they pressed hers gently. He could crush my hand like an eggshell, she thought, and the idea gave her a delicious little chill of apprehension. She studied his face. His features were large. The bones of his jaw and cheek and forehead seemed weighty and massive as stone. His nose was big with a Roman bridge to it, his brow was beetling, and his mouth was big and mobile. He reminded her strongly of a younger, more handsome Abraham Lincoln. He isn't yet forty, she estimated, so young for the rank and the job. Then she realised with a start that she was still holding his hand, and that she had not replied to his greeting. He was leaning over her, studying her as openly and intently as she was him. And Aby and Rachel were looking from one to the other of them with interest and amusement. Sontaine had to shake her hand lightly to free it from his grip, and to her horror she felt the hot rush of blood up her throat into her cheeks. I'm blushing. It was something she had not done in years. I have been fortunate enough to be associated with your family before this, Blaine Malcolmus told her. His teeth also were large and square and very white. His mouth was wide, even wider when he smiled. A little shakily she smiled back. Have you? She realised that it wasn't the most sparkling conversational gambit, but her wits seemed to have deserted her. She was standing there like a schoolgirl, blushing and gawking at him. 
His eyes were a most startling shade of green. They distracted her. I served under General Sean Courtney in France, he told her, still smiling. Somebody had cut his hair too short at the temples. It made his large ears stick out. That irritated her, and yet the sticking out ears made him endearing and appealing. He was a fine gentleman, Blaine Malcolmus went on. Yes, he was, she replied, and upbraided herself. Say something witty, something intelligent. He'll think you're a clod. He was wearing dress uniform, dark blue and gold, with a double row of medal ribbons. Since girlhood, uniforms had always affected her. I heard that you were at General Courtney's headquarters in Arras for a few weeks in 1917. I was still in the line then. I didn't go on his staff until the end of that year. She took a deep breath to steady herself and at last managed to get control again. What turbulent days those were, with the universe crashing in ruins about us, she said, her voice low and husky. Her French accent emphasised a little, and she thought, What is this? What's happening to you, Santaine? This is not the way it is supposed to be. Remember, Michael and Chasser. Give this man a friendly nod and pass on. It seems that I have performed my duties for the moment. Blaine Malcolmus glanced at his ADC for confirmation and then turned back to Santaine. May I have the honour of this waltz, Mrs. Courtney? He offered his arm and without a moment's hesitation she laid her fingers lightly in the crook of his elbow. The other dancers veered away, leaving them an open space as they walked out side by side onto the floor. She turned to face Blaine and stepped into the circle of his arm. He didn't have to move. Merely the way he held her told her that he would be a marvellous dancer. Immediately she felt light and dainty and fleet of foot, and she arched her back and leaned out against the circle of his arm, while his lower body seemed to meld with hers. He took her on one spinning, whirling circuit of the floor, and when she matched his every move, feather light and swift, he began a complicated series of dips and counter-turns, and she followed him without conscious effort, seeming to skim the ground, yet totally under his control, responding to his every whim. When at last the music ended with a crashing chord, and the musicians fell back in their seats, sweating and panting, Santaine felt unreasonable resentment towards them, they had not played long enough. Blaine Markhamus was still holding her in the middle of the floor, and they were laughing delightedly at each other while the other dancers formed a ring around them and applauded. Unfortunately, that seems to be it for the moment, he said, still making no effort to release her, and his words roused her. There was no longer any excuse for physical contact, and she stepped back from him reluctantly, and acknowledged the applause with a small curtsy. I do think we have earned a glass of champagne. Blaine signalled one of the white-jacketed waiters, and they stood at the edge of the dance floor and sipped the wine, and watched each other's eyes avidly as they talked. The exertion had raised a light sheen of sweat on his broad forehead, and she could smell it on his body. They were alone in the centre of the crowded room. With a subtle inclination of her shoulders and head, Santaine dissuaded the one or two bolder souls who approached as if to join them, and after that the others stayed back. The band, refreshed and eager, took their seats on the bandstand once more, and this time launched into a foxtrot. Blaine Markhamus did not have to ask... Santaine set her almost untouched champagne on the silver tray that the waiter proffered and lifted her arms as Blaine faced her. The more sedate rhythm of the foxtrot enabled them to continue talking, and there was so much to talk about. He had known Sean Courtney well and held him in affection and admiration. 
Santaine had loved him almost as much as she had loved her own father. They discussed the dreadful circumstances in which Sean Courtney and his wife had been murdered, and their mutual horror and outrage at the deed seemed to draw them still closer together. Blaine knew the beloved northern provinces around Arras in her native France, and his battalion had held a section of the line near Mordom, her home village. He remembered the burnt-out ruins of her family's chateau. We used it as an artillery observation post, he told her. I spent many hours perched up in the north wing. His descriptions induced a pleasant nostalgia, a fine sadness to heighten her emotions. He loved horses, as she did, and was a twelve-goal polo player. Twelve goals! she exclaimed. My son will be most impressed. He has just been rated a four-goal man. How old is your son? he asked. Fourteen. Very good for a youngster of that age. I'd like to see him in action. That would be fun, she agreed, and suddenly she wanted to tell him all about Chasser. But again the music ended and cut her short, and this time he frowned also. They are playing very short pieces, aren't they? he said. Then she felt him start, and he released her waist. Though she kept her hand on his arm, the strange elated mood which had gripped them both shattered, and something dark and intrusive passed like a shadow between them. She was not sure what it was. Ah, he said somberly. I see she has returned. She wasn't at all well this evening, but she always was a plucky one. To whom are you referring? Santaine asked. His tone had filled her with foreboding, and she should have been warned by it, but still the shock of it made her flinch when he said softly, My wife. Santaine felt quite giddy for a moment, and she only kept her balance with an effort when she let her hand fall from his arm. I would like you to meet my wife, he said. May I introduce you to her? She nodded, unwilling to trust her voice, and when he offered his arm again, she hesitated before she took it, and this time laid her fingertips only lightly upon it. He led her across the floor towards the group at the foot of the main staircase, and as they approached, Santaine searched the faces of the women, trying to guess which one it would be. Only two of them were young, and none was beautiful. None could compete with her in looks, or strength, or poise, or talent, or wealth. She felt a surge of confidence and anticipation replace the momentary confusion and despondency that had thrown her off balance. Without thinking about it, she knew she was going into a desperate contest, and she was buoyed up with battle lust and the enormity of the prize at stake. She was eager to identify and assess her adversary, and she lifted her chin and set her shoulders as they stopped before the group. The ranks of men and women opened respectfully, and there she was, looking up at Santaine with lovely, tragic eyes. She was younger than Santaine, and possessed of a rare and exquisite beauty. She wore her gentle nature and goodness like a shining cloak for all to see. But her sadness was in the smile she gave Santaine, as Blaine Malcolmus introduced them. Mrs. Courtney, may I present my wife, Isabella? You dance exquisitely, Mrs. Courtney. I have been watching you and Blaine with great pleasure, she said. He does so love dancing. Thank you, Mrs. Malcolmus, Santaine whispered huskily, while inside she raged. Oh, you little bitch! It's not fair! You aren't fighting fair! How can I ever win now? Oh, God, how I hate you! Isabella Malcolmus sat in a wheelchair with her nurse behind her. The ankles of her thin, paralysed legs 
showed under the hem of her evening dress. They were pale and skeletal, and her feet seemed fragile and vulnerable in their sequined dancing pumps. He'll never leave you. Santaine felt herself choke on her grief. He's that kind of man. He'll never desert a crippled wife. Santaine awoke an hour before dawn and lay for a moment wondering at the strange sense of well-being that possessed her. Then she remembered and threw back the sheets, eager for the day to begin. With both bare feet upon the floor, she paused, and her eyes instinctively went to the framed photograph of Michael Courtney on the bedside table. Michelle, I'm sorry, she whispered. I love you. I still love you. I always will. But I can't help this other thing. I didn't want it. I didn't look for it. Please forgive me, my darling. It's been so long and so lonely. I want him, Michel. I want to marry him and have him for myself. She took up the frame and for a moment held it to her bosom. Then she opened the drawer, laid the photograph face down upon her folded lace underwear and closed the drawer again. She dumped to her feet and reached for the yellow Chinese silk dressing gown with the bird of paradise embroidered down the back. Belting it, she hurried through to the saloon of the coach and seated herself at her desk to compose the telegraph to Sir Gary in their private code, for the message would be transmitted over the public lines. Please urgently forward all intelligence on Lieutenant Colonel Blaine Malcolmus, newly appointed administrator of South West Africa. Reply in code, Love Juno. She rang for her secretary and chafed while she waited for him. He came through in a flannel dressing gown, owl-eyed and unshaven. Get that off right away. She handed him the flimsy. Then get me Abraham Abrahams on the telephone. Santaine, it's six o'clock in the morning, Aby protested, and we didn't get to bed until three o'clock. Three hours is enough sleep for any good lawyer. Aby, I want you to invite Colonel Malcolmness and his wife to dine with me in my coach this evening. There was a long, weighty silence, and the static hissed on the line. You and Rachel are invited, of course, she filled the silence. It's much too much short notice, he said carefully, obviously choosing his words with precision. The administrator is a busy man. He won't come. Get the invitation to him personally, Santaine ignored the protest. Send your messenger round to his office and see he gets it. Under no circumstances... Let his wife receive the invitation first. He won't come, Aby repeated stubbornly. At least I hope to God he won't come. What do you mean by that? she snapped. You are playing with fire, Santaine. Not just a little candle flame, but a great raging bush fire. She pursed her lips. Mind your own business, and I'll mind mine. She started, and he broke in on her. Kiss your own sweetheart, and I'll kiss mine. He finished the childhood law for her, and she giggled. He had never heard Santaine Courtney giggle before. It took him by surprise. How appropriate, dear Aby, she said. She giggled again and his voice was truly agitated when he told her, You pay me an enormous retainer to mind your business for you. Santaine, you set a hundred tongues wagging last night. The whole town will be agog this morning. You are a marked woman. Everybody watches you. You just cannot afford to carry on like this. Aby, you and I both know that I can afford to do any damn thing I choose. Send that invitation, please. 
She rested that afternoon. It had been a late night and she was determined to look her best for the evening. Her secretary woke her a little after four in the afternoon. Aby had received a reply to the invitation. The administrator and his lady would be pleased to dine with her that evening. She smiled triumphantly, then turned to decode the telegram from Sir Gary, which had also arrived while she was asleep. For Juno, stop. Subject full names, Blaine Marsden Malcolmus, born Johannesburg, 28th of July, 1893. So... He is nearly thirty-nine years old, she exclaimed. And he is a Leo, my big growly lion. She returned eagerly to the cable. Second son of James Marsden Malcolmus, lawyer and mining entrepreneur, chairman Consolidated Goldfields and director numerous associated companies, deceased 1922. Subject was educated St. John's College, Johannesburg, and Oriel College, Oxford. Academic honours include Rhodes Scholarship and Oriel Scholarship. Sporting honours include full blue cricket and half blues, athletics and polo. Graduated MA honours, Oxen, 1912. Called to the Bar, 1913. Commissioned Second Lieutenant, Natal Mounted Rifles, 1914. Service in Southwest Africa campaign. Mentioned in dispatches twice. Promoted captain, 1915. France with BEF, 1915. Military cross, August, 1915. Promoted major and bar to MC, 1916. Promoted lieutenant colonel, OC 3rd Battalion, 1917. Staff of general officer commanding 6th Division, 1918. Versailles Armistice Negotiations on Staff of General Smuts. Partner in law firm Sterling and Malcolmus from 1919. Member Parliament for Gardens, 1924. Deputy Minister Justice, 1926-9. Appointed Administrator South West Africa, 11th of May 1932. Married Isabella Tara, Nay Harrison, 1918. Two daughters, Tara Isabella and Matilda Janine.